This podcast is brought to you by Texas Performance MC. You can check Texas Performance MC out on Instagram as well as on their website, texasperformancemc.com. Mark's down there in Cedar Park, Texas. He is the one that handles all of my bike service work and custom work as far as, uh, you know, keeping that motor running tip top and, uh, you know, everything. He's my dude. He also handles a lot of my close friends, and he should be working on your bike too. So uh, check him out, Cedar Park, Texas. If you're in Texas, then he should be the one working on your bike. So check him out. What's up, guys? Uh, thank you for being here again. Um, I know we've been starting off this month a little bit slow, but uh, I promise you we got quite a few coming for you this month. Um, just busy, man. I've been trying to paint my own bike and get it done, working after hours and late, trying to dial that in as well as get some customer bikes done because, you know, got to make some money too, you know what I mean? So it's just been been a busy couple, you know, first two weeks of this month. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to getting all that shit rolling. I uh, hope, uh, hope to see a lot of you guys at our camp out, man. The Fast Life camp out is going to be Friday, April 27th through Sunday, April 28th at Adam Sandoval's K River Campground. It's in Moyers, Oklahoma. It's uh, some really great riding. It's going to be a really great time. Um, it's I don't know what to say about it, man. It's not a show. It's, it's just it's the most basic grassroots group. Sorry, I'm fucking up. Most basic grassroots style of a motorcycle event that you could ever, you know, go to. You know, it's a. Uh, you don't have you can come alone man you you know we're, we're kind of getting everybody to camp in the same spot so we're all hanging out uh getting to know one one in, uh, fuck one another i think fuck i'm out of practice man i need to do these podcasts more <laughs> anyway i hope to see you guys out there uh you don't have to make any reservations just show up and uh, be ready to have a good time man so uh come through man i want to thank my new sponsor John Jessup's Dream Rides, man. I know you guys have heard his podcast we did with him. He's a great dude. He's also built some of the dopest FXRs. Definitely my top five FXRs ever. He ha- he has two of them. Uh, so check him out always. You can uh, He's up there in NorCal, man, in the uh, Stockton area. Wilson Way, actually. Um, check him out. Dream Rides John on Instagram. Um, they do in-house uh, dyno tuning, obviously, bike sales. They got all the parts you could ever want. Uh, they build bikes, obviously. I just told you about that, and uh, you know, like I said, they fix them and service them and, and keep them on the road. So, te- check them out, TeamDreamRides.com, and uh, I think there's a little bit of an online store on there as well. So, if you want to go check it out, maybe you can find some shit for your bike if you're not in an area where you have, you know, somebody to do work with or whatever. But check them out, TeamDreamRides.com. Also, if you use offer code FastLife at the end, you get 10% off on whatever you buy. That's got to be cool, right? So, yeah, check it out. Check him out. Thank you, John. Uh, You guys go give him a follow. I also want to thank Kevin over at BigBearPerformance.com. You can check out their website. Uh, Obviously, we did a podcast with them uh, recently as well and talked pretty in-depth about Olin suspension and how great it can make your Harley uh, handle better, ride better, stop better, uh, just perform better. So, Go over there, BigBearPerformance.com. Uh, you can phone in orders at 909-478-7788, and that will get you set up basically with some great suspension. Uh, you'll be talking to Kevin personally. He's the one that handles all the phone calls and uh, all your questions about suspension and, and the other products they sell there. He's very competent, confident <laughs> in in that in, in the in the suspension that they sell. You know, he he guarantees that if it doesn't do it you're expecting it to do he'll buy it back from you you know what i mean so check it out you can't go wrong with that stuff um he's done the research he's been dialing in suspension for quite some time and you know there's a lot of options for you to do you don't have to go full balls to the wall inverted front end there's other options so check them out man uh big bear performance thank you sir i also want to thank paint huff for metal flake my dude man i've been I haven't been doing this flake as much, but I've been using the shit out of some pearls, man. So on my my personal bike, I didn't flake it, I didn't leaf it. I kind of wanted to get out of that 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 kind of scene for a little bit. Uh, not necessarily get out of it from doing it. I just wanted my bike to be a little bit something I've been trying to kind of evolve into, I guess you'd say. So we actually use a lot of the uh, Chemical Candy uh, Specialized Line pearls on the bike. So uh, can't really show you a picture of it, but uh, if you go to my Instagram, you can check it out. But also, you can always go to Paint Huff for Metal Flake on Instagram and see a ton of really talented artists uh, work from all over the world, as well as PaintHuffer.com if you want to order some of that stuff for yourself. So go check them out and tell them the Fast Life podcast sent you. Man, my dude, uh, Ryan Townsend's here. We, we, 
caught him while he was coming back through Dallas and we just kind of catch up, you know, it's like me and his friendship has turned into a podcast thing. So it's kind of, it's kind of cool. He'll, he'll come in do a podcast and we'll sit there and talk for an hour or two at, later after the podcast. So, um, uh, really glad to have him on and really exciting seeing his journey from, you know, being an airbrush artist to pursuing the tattoo career. And then, you know, him and his chick getting a, an RV and running across the country. It's just, it's always good talks, man. And seeing how he's growing in progress. And so, uh, here he is, man. Check out my dude, Ryan Townsend. Hey guys, you ready to let the dogs out? Fast life podcast. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Yeah. Well, welcome to Texas, man. Now we're running. Welcome, ba- welcome back to Texas, man. Oh yeah, I love Texas. So how was uh, how was Cali? That's where you were at for the last couple of months, right? California's a blast. Uh, we were there for three months. Mm-hmm. We stayed in an RV park next door to Disneyland. Not even a, no, it wasn't an RV park. It was a trailer park, like a, a mobile home park. Um, so we had like a regular residence. There. That's cool. Yeah. Was it super expensive or was it pretty? Uh, it was eleven $1, hundred, um, which month. is stupid cheap. So, uh, comparatively, like if you wanted to stay a month at like a regular RV park, like the RV parks there, are, like for my size of a rig, that you have to be smashed in like sardines. Mm-hmm. And when I say like sardines, I mean there's just like they basically have to use a forklift just to get you into the spot. Yeah. Um, Damn. <laughs> For the size that I have, it's a 40-foot rig, so, um, but Faith was able to find a, uh, um, a mobile home park, mm-hmm. and so we parked there, so we had wide open space. We were living it, living it up. We had a nice spot. How is it, uh, how is that shit out there? Is it, you said it was like 1100 bucks a, a... For the parking, for, for the... For the whole time, or just the month? No, the month. Okay, that's about rent. <laughs> yeah, when you're talking about... Uh, but in Anaheim, pretty much, right? We were in Anaheim. Like, we, we could walk to Disneyland. Yeah. Um, which we ended up getting a um, season pass to Disneyland. And we would yeah. go there and have dinner at night with our buddies, Mondo and Stacy. Mm-hmm. And uh, we would sit on the... Uh, we would be in uh, uh, California Adventure. There's a, there's a restaurant there. What's the restaurant called? Faith? It used to call it Ariel something or other, but it's like right on the water. So when the the uh, water fountain show comes on, yeah, like we just sit there and we get drunk and we watch the water fountain show <laughs> and it's cool. just beautiful and there's a big Ferris wheel. But we would do that pretty often, and then I would tattoo. You're starting to get pretty uh, pretty much a decent customer base out in California yet. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. California um, California is a different market. Like I, I mainly go to California to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to be great, you know, I want to be a great tattooer and I've got a lot of friends out there and my mentors out there. And uh, so uh, I'm trying to build a client base so that I can go out there on a regular basis. So I want to spend three months a year uh, yeah, in California. Good. So far we're doing all right. Um, it's definitely a harder market because California is the epicenter of black and gray tattooing mm-hmm. and I'm a black and gray tattooer. Yeah. So to be a great tattooer in that environment isn't saying a lot because everybody's a great tattooer. Yeah, so, but, but being in that mix with those people, it's, uh, you know. That's why I go to learn. Yeah. I want to be around them. Yeah. You so be the, money isn't my motivator. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Money's my motivator, like, when I'm in Texas because mm-hmm. uh, Texas has a, a, a much better market. Um, but uh, California is definitely for, for learning and growing. Do you ever get to you get to do much airbrush work out there or any of those? Yeah, kind of- I was airbrushing. Luckily, the the shop I work in, the Vatican, um, it, the owner Franco Viscovi, uh, he is an airbrusher too, and so I get to paint with him. And my mentor works for yeah, him, Mondo. Right? Mondo and Mondo airbrushes. He teaches the class with me, and so me and him paint. So I get to paint in the studio. That's cool. Um, so I tattoo and paint in the same place. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a fantastic place. It's heaven over there, honestly, working in California. So it's definitely a big motivator for me to grow a clientele out there so I can spend more time. Yeah, the uh, the um, 
there's a lot of I mean I, I want to say I know those guys like I I follow Mondo now but the other guy you had mentioned I, I know I follow him for something Franco yeah like isn't he pretty- Franco's like a legend in the tattoo world yeah um, he is the owner of Bishop Rotary um, oh, okay yeah he kind of follow. popularized the modern tattoo machine um, if not, was one of the, he's probably one of the cornerstone people of mm-hmm. getting it off the ground and making it the way it is now. So uh, he's nothing but knowledge. Um, last time I was there, so I would every time me and Franco would end up in conversation, I would always say like, like, like I I would express to him how desperate I was to mm-hmm. have all his you know the knowledge, the knowledge you know and and so like he would start explaining something to me and I would just let him know, like, please continue. Like, yeah, you know, don't ever that. think that you're boring me in yeah. any way. And so we were in conversation about something. We were, we were looking at Instagram and, um, right now on Instagram with the tattoo world, uh, there's a lot of people faking it out there. And so it's hard for even us as tattooers to know when somebody is lying in their tattoo photos or not. So it's it's definitely even no matter how good you do you'll find somebody on Instagram that is just doing so much better that you feel inadequate and so I was talking to Franco about it. I'm like, "How what's going on? This is this is like these people are so good. It's it's ridiculous." And mm-hmm. he was like, "Well, a lot of them." And we were kind of going over what was real and what wasn't. And through that conversation, I told him how desperate I was to be that good and all that. And so I was lucky enough he uh, tattooed me and I had a little one-on-one lesson yeah. with him so so is it more like they people are just doctoring up photos basically yeah that's real bad in the tattoo world man for real, real bad there's not a lot of, I mean granted there's a lot of people that are killing it that mm-hmm. are doing that good but there's a huge number of people that are uh photoshopping their work which in some cases I think that's okay if you're if you're like it's kind of like everyone knows that McDonald's the quarter pounder pounder doesn't look like that in real life yeah yeah but you still want to be able to produce well, what it, you're what you're selling. It gives a false sense of like the product that you're getting. You know, yeah, burger is one thing, but like the, uh, you know, when you it, it happens with paint too because mm-hmm. when people start doctoring up photos and and playing with the you know the white balance and shit like that, right. you make colors look different than they actually look in real life. Right. And people are like, oh well, you know, that bike looked a lot good better on Instagram. You know yeah. What yeah. I mean? So. It's fun. Well, in the tattoo world, you almost have to like we. There, there's kind of like a, a a code of honor. Like there's there's some people that are like they like to stick to the basics. So they'll you know their their code of honor is like I'll take a I'm gonna click it with my phone and post it as is. Mm-hmm. But those are very rare. Those are the kind of the the old school hardcore kind of guys. But they're always gonna get outshined by these yeah. people that are probably less. They're lesser tattooers. And they Photoshop because I thought people were only just like maybe taking a little bit of the red out, desaturating it a little bit just so that the red isn't distracting to the eye. Mm-hmm. But no, they're full on like going in there with the airbrush tool oh, shit. and correcting lines and softening. Um, I had a buddy show me an edit. So I, I was like, yeah, because I, I, you know, I'm the kind of person I don't lie. Like my airbrush photos are not doctored in any way whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Like I don't even... I don't even mess with the contrast. I just mm. post them the way that I photograph them. And so with my tattoos, I would have to mess with the contrast just to take some of the red out. And I thought, well, most people couldn't be doing any more than that. There's, there's gotta be some integrity there. Yeah. And then my buddy showed me a filter, which I'm savvy with Photoshop, but I've never seen a filter like this where he just basically moved a slider over and it smoothed the entire tattoo out to where wow. it was like, and you, Looked like it was airbrushed on there. It looked like it was so smooth, and I was like, motherfuckers. Like, it just pissed me off. Like, I was like, now I don't know who's actually that good and who isn't. Yeah, yeah. Because you, they're straight up lying. You have to go into every photo and almost doc, like pick it apart to find if they were editing. But the sad part about it, it doesn't matter if they're editing that or not. They're selling that to the public, and the yeah. public is believing it, and the public thinks now that that's that's the norm that's what's normal yeah and there's a lot of guys and i don't want to say any names but i've caught a lot of guys now that i'm like i'm talking they've got more followers than 
yeah fucking kardashians <laughs> and they they're lying yeah it's it, crazy it seems like a lot of i mean the tattoo thing man you know i was having a conversation with someone recently and i was trying to explain to them like man tattoos are so much more widely a part of culture than like airbrushing or motorcycles you know what i mean like more people have tattoos than ride motorcycles in the world in the right. world right mm-hmm. so it's um you know, when you see somebody that does really great work, it's easy for them to have a, a ridiculous amount of following, which for the tattooing industry is fucking awesome because that's, you know, you have 100,000 followers in tattooing. That's a lot of potential customers, you know, if they're following you because they, you know, genuinely like your artwork. But it, it does seem like nowadays there's just so many people that are fucking so good. It's like it is a norm. Well, yeah. there are. That's another thing. For every liar, there's a legit person who is as good as advertised. And I I think that's amazing. I love because like when I started tattooing or when I started airbrushing, Corey St. Clair was that person to me. And I chased him down. You know, I went and found him. Yeah. I made him a friend and 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 we were able to, he was able to teach me. And I love that, that when you find somebody who is that good, you can seek them out. But the tattoo world, even though that's true in a lot of ways, it's not true in a lot of ways. Um, how do you how do you feel about like, like how do you set yourself apart in the tattoo industry? Like with the airbrush thing, it was, yeah. You have to have, well, there's, it's kind of like, I, I kind of compare it to music where it don't matter how good you are with your instrument or with your vocals or writing songs even, you have to hit that special lick that speaks to mm-hmm. people or be very good at advertising. Mm. Or, I mean, think of like today with you have like auto tune and all that other bullshit that'll like make anyone a pop star. Yeah. That's kind of like the people that over edit their photos. And then there's um, pop music, which there's people out there that just stick to the hits. Yeah. And that's how they get followers. And then there's people like I think that I am a little bit where. I'm just trying to be the best damn technician that I can be. Like I'm trying to be as good as possible. And I don't, I'm not really stressing too hard on speaking to anyone like, or following a trend. I just want to be good now. So that's kind of the equivalent of learning to play guitar really well, but now you have to write a hit song. Yeah. And, um, I'm not sure what that is. I just let, I just do what the customers ask me to do, but have you, have you like, enjoyed a lot of what they asked you to do or have you been no there's i mean i enjoy that i get to do art for a living that's Mm. that's amazing so i can't complain too much like my worst day is better than my like so many days of working a normal job but (laughs) like um you know like some days you get difficult clients or you get stuff that you don't want to do but with time i'm able to be better about picking the right tattoos that are meant for me because in the beginning you start taking on like almost anything that comes your way and it really isn't um yeah best practice i I was i was kind of leading into that because i've i got other friends that are tattooists and hopefully they don't listen to this but they're like you'll see something do like a some flowers or you know some some script or some some of the more stuff that you see done a lot more often and it's really nice or it's very good for you know that i mean it might not be the some big time you know follower uh, instagram thing but then you'll see them try something that they're obviously not really good at yeah and then they'll post it and i'm like dude i wouldn't have posted that one you know or like i i wouldn't like if i was putting myself in, in that position i wouldn't take on jobs i didn't think i could really do a really good job Whoa. at i would do those on my time with like hey you know one of my friends like hey man i want to try this thing and he's you know he's covered in tattoos so it's going to look better than probably the, his shit, but it, I'm not doing it on some customer that's paying a lot of money, and I'd practice that style or that look or that, that image. There's um, some people that... Well, now, all of us dabble in things. Yeah. You know, all of us try some things that we just want to see if we can pull it off, and sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. But um, then there's people that are just trying to make a living so yeah. they don't care if it's the best of that they're just doing what is asked of them and as long as they pull it off that's enough well do you get this like so if you do a piece and you put it on instagram or you know whatever social media do you get requests for stuff like that again yep. 
it drives it and like the, I don't I don't post things that I like I don't post things that I don't want more of and yeah. it's not that it's not that I don't enjoy doing that style it's now I'm getting to a point in my tattoo career where I'm trying to drive it in a specific direction because I know the things that I can hit really well like there's certain things like for instance family portraits animal portraits um I can do like roses and and sculptures and and you know type black and gray things that every time it comes my way mm -hmm. I can pull it off I'm effective I'm efficient mm -hmm. I'm dependable to do a good job every time and then there's other things that come my way which are more of a struggle where I'm probably not the best suited artist for that genre of Do you ever get like a lot of anxiety or oh, like, yeah. like that kind of shit going through those jobs that are like yep. a little uncertain, you know? Real I mean? bad anxiety. Yeah. Um I'm the same way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it's sometimes it's like if every tattoo was just for me to copy something, mm -hmm. why well, I would just copy everything and there's no thinking involved and you just copy it. That's, so that's not an issue. Like for instance, I'm not doing color anymore. Not because I can't do it, because I'm trying to drive. Like I can copy anything. Yeah. Doesn't matter if it's color, black and gray, whatever. But I don't want. I don't want my clientele to. I want. Yeah. I want. I want to be more specific. Like I have a friend who who really. Um, he shines with owls. Like his owls are, are phenomenal, yeah. and so he really drives those. And he's very efficient. He's very effective. And he's narrowed. Now, he does other things. Plenty of other things. But... That's his specialty, though. It's his, his specialty. Yeah. And, and, and it, when it comes to an owl, you, you're best to go to him. Because yeah. this guy knows him inside and out. He knows their history. He knows everything about them. And I, there's something about that that I think is great. Like, I want to be that good at a few things. I want to be a master of a few things and not stretch myself so thin because there is a lot of anxiety like if i'm doing west coast like black and gray one style one day and then the next day i have to be like a um color realism guy i gotta put on a new hat every day and and sometimes that's not best i could be better at yeah one it, it, it feels like you really do have to go down a long long rabbit hole type path of one style to really master it yeah. You know, and it, it's years, you know, yeah. and if I aspects. get bored with it, I'll, I'll start doing something else. And that's basically like, you know, that's kind of where I'm getting now with like the, some of the techniques I learned from you with just the black and gray. I'm not saying that I mastered it, but I'm getting to a point where, okay, well now I want to start putting more color back into the pictures. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I want to do some color photos, uh, on the helmets that I do and shit. And it's, uh, it's like I, the last time I did something in color was 2012 yeah an airbrush like a like a girl or anything like that so i want to do it but fuck man it's been so long it's like i don't even know if i have the colors laying around the shop to make flesh tones and i stuff. actually threw out all my colors for real uh, not my airbrush colors i, I still do that but uh, oh, the tattoo color yeah my tattoo colors um and it wasn't it was just to really kind of commit myself to black mm -hmm. and gray yeah. like i have friends that only use one needle for real. like literally they've they're narrowed their style down so much. They have one bottle of ink and they have one needle and that's it. Mm -hmm. They don't use anything else because they really want to master that one technique. Mm -hmm. And every single tattoo is that technique. So don't even ask them for anything else because you're not getting it. You're going to get. Yeah, it feels like, uh, you know, especially, you know, a lot of this kind of translate into the paint world, too. But it's like, you know, in some aspects, you can still have that same like, uh, like, you know what, man? Every tattoo I get, I want Ryan Townsend to do, so I go to you for everything. And then sometimes you can build that relationship, especially like you were just talking about how you were kind of trying to, you know, narrow down the things that you're doing to something you want to specialize in. Right. Well, sometimes like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, uh, say I've been, you've done my whole sleeve, but then I get an idea I want to do. It's a little bit off the beaten path, you know, but it's still black and gray. It might be something different. Yeah, yeah you can be off like... For instance, like I like doing portraits. So if you come in with a portrait of, a, say, a pirate, but in the background there's a pirate ship, that's not off the beaten path. It's yeah. just adding to it. So, but like for instance, me, like I get jealous, honestly, of artists. Now I don't know if it's just what's in their portfolio, or if they actually get to do this every day. But artists who have nothing but portraits, 
Mm-hmm. So every single picture is a portrait. I'm so jealous. I'm like, where are those people? Like, nobody asks me to do portraits. It's the thing that I'm most proud of, the thing that I'm most obsessed with, yet I never get asked to do it. Mm-hmm. And like, I know if I was able to practice portraits at least two days a week. Yeah. Right now I'm lucky. Can you do a lot of portraits in like one sitting or is it usually? I can do them in a sitting and a half. Sometimes I can do them in one. Mm-hmm. Um, depends on, it usually depends on what shirt they're wearing or what hairstyle they have. <laughs> but um, usually I, if they have like a simple shirt and a simple hairstyle, I can do them in one sitting. If they have a plaid shirt, a necklace and some crazy yeah, hair, then, yeah. Yeah, then I have to do it in two settings, which I start scheduling two day in a row so yeah. I can get them down in one shot. But there's certain artists that I really look up to in the p- portraits and I get upset that I, I was like, I know I could do that if somebody would just let me do it, yeah. you know, and, and not many people, I don't know what it is. I guess there's something about having a face on you. It's a lot of, it's hard to sell for me. Yeah. But then again, what's crazy when you see these guys that look like they do it every day, I'm like, where are these people coming from? Well, I think it's like everything, like, especially I'm sure now you follow a lot of tattoo artists on uh, social media. So it's like one day we were talking about this with, with like uh, our scene of motorcycles that we're into right now, like FXRs and Dynas, a specific type of bike. We get online and we follow these people and these companies that are based on that. So we feel like, fuck, man, this shit's big mm-hmm. because it's all we see on Instagram. Right. Yeah. But it's like you start following a bunch of fucking portrait artists. Next thing you know, you're just swollen down. You know, you're swip- swiping down. You're like portrait, portrait, portrait. You're like, fuck, man, everybody's doing portraits. Yeah. And but I it's can't like get five one. dudes. You know what I mean? It's funny because you do really get the same things pretty repetitively. Yeah. Um, I don't want to call out too many of the repetitive stuff because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But, um, well, I think for a lot of it, though, man, it becomes that like you get good at one thing, right? Like that's your thing that you can knock out of the part every time, every time. And so if the demand's there, if you got a hundred people wanting that, that thing that you're really good, it's like, fuck man, like I kind of should do it. I made that realization sometime maybe last year or the year before where I found myself complaining about certain tattoos that I would get repetitive. Mm -hmm. Like, um, not, it's not because I disagree with the content. It's just not what I saw myself doing. So like for instance, doves, I never, there was never a time where I would sit down and want to draw a dove. It's yeah. not something that I really care for, but I get asked to do it a lot. Yeah. So I found myself complaining or getting like frustrated if a dove walked in and I thought that's not a good way to be. So one day, and I don't know if somebody inspired me to be this way or if I just thought of it, but I was like, um, well, if I'm going to do doves, I'm going to do the best goddamn doves yeah. that I can possibly do. And so I just obsessed over doves. Next thing you know, I was good at doves and now mm-hmm. I don't mind them anymore. And I, I did the same thing over like pocket watches mm-hmm. um, because it's not that I don't, I disagree with pocket watches. It's just I'm more of an organic minded person. I like facial features. I like things that are like come from nature, mm-hmm. not so much mechanical. And so... Uh, I was getting frustrated with doing pocket watches until one day I was watching another artist where I saw him on his third day of pocket watches yet he was killing it Yeah. and I was like you know what this guy is murdering these pocket watches and he doesn't seem to have a problem with it what's my problem so I kind of did the same thing I'm like well if I'm going to be doing pocket watches I better be damn good at it yeah yeah for sure and that's kind of the thing i wanted to do with you know adding you know like i said like i had made that statement earlier about everything that you put on your your you know your advertisement for your social media it's like i only put things that i'm willing to do again you know what i mean on there i don't want Mm -hmm. to like do something like i always use this reference i don't want to airbrush an entire helmet like all muraled out fucking you know last supper type bullshit all over it and then if i put it on the internet you know, you'll get it. You'll have people to are going to want that. Yeah. And I'm like, man, like there's, you know, there's only so much money I can get to do that helmet. Like I'm, I'm not going to get five grand to paint a helmet. Right. Unless so, you start asking for five grand. Yeah. Right? But I don't really want, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to work on it. Like there, there's certain things like for me, I'm, I'm finding that there's certain projects where time isn't an issue. Like I don't mind if it takes forever. And it's usually something for myself because I'm not stressing myself out about being done with it. 
and I'm not looking at a paycheck at the end of it, right? Right. So when it comes to doing it for someone else, like, you know, it has to be something that I know that I can kill, make it look great. I, you know, Stress might free. try something a little bit new here and there, but I'm not going to deviate too far off the path of what I know is going to look badass. And that's what I'm selling. I'm selling that. I'm going to try this other shit. And if it's, if I could find a way to do it efficiently, but you know, I, I just, I don't want to be wrapped up in two weeks worth of airbrush work on a helmet for five grand, which is good money, mm-hmm. but I, that's, it's such a long project on such a small thing. I don't know if, if I would have the, uh, the attention span to give it as much effort as, as I did on the right side of the project as I get to the left, you know, am I going to get over it? by the middle and be like, I'm done with this. I'm just, I, I honestly, I really do. I'm a big believer. If you're not having fun doing it, you yeah. shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing it. It should be somebody who's having fun doing it. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's in the tattoo world. That's in the airbrush world. Like I don't like doing tape out graphics. Mm-hmm. Like it has nothing to do. Like I honestly think tape out graphics are beautiful, mm-hmm. but it don't matter how it's an art form. Yeah. And I, I'm, it's much better for my client to have somebody like you do the tape out graphics, somebody who actually has a knack for it and who enjoys it. Like, I'm sure if I had, if I enjoyed it more, I'd probably be better Mm -hmm. at it. But I just like, it's like one of those things, like when I see a line that's off with some tape, it puts me in, it just makes me mad. Yeah. And then I, to, and so I just end up being pissy Mm -hmm. and, and it's just like, why should I even do this? Like, there's yeah. somebody who enjoys doing this, and it's not me. Sometimes I, you know, during doing custom paint and doing all this stuff, it's like I wish I would have been, not to say it in a bad way, but a one trick pony, because then I could have focused on that one trick and got really fucking good at that one thing. But not having other painters around and having to rely to do everything myself or whatever, it's like you end up picking up pinstriping and doing well, all this other shit. And back in the day, there was like things were used to be local, right? Yeah. Before the internet. And this is the way my dad was, and, and this is the way I was in the beginning, where you, everyone, maybe it just, it's young, being young and ignorant, I guess, but everybody wants to, like, when you're in the beginning, you want to be a master of everything. Yeah. You don't want to be weak at anything, and so you start doing everything until you've been trying to do everything for 10 years, and you realize that you've been creating all this crazy stress for yourself mm-hmm. when you could have been a master of something else. Like, there's so many people out there to do stuff like tattoos there's no reason i should be doing every type of tattoo. every type of tattoo if if the guy sitting next to me really loves doing it like uh there's a guy corbill that sits next to me he does these ornamental shapes that are just beautiful and mm-hmm. he does it without thought yeah, yeah at least to me it looks like he's not thinking he just does it well it's like you know i know i'm glad you said that because there's there's a couple of painters one specific that, that's gotten real I would say popular over the last year or so that he hand draws all these really badass like ornate types or ornamental type images over on, on the paint jobs and he just draws them out cuts them out and it's really nice but that dude specializes in that mm-hmm. like he can take you can give him any shape an octagon or an oblong type thing and say hey draw something ornamental in there and he has it he do, yeah. it's i would associate so, so that with like now- a graffiti artist as well it's a style of art that someone has like mastered or so it's better for somebody to to collaborate yeah yeah. than it is to try to be that person like you don't want to be if you're a client you don't walk into you to ask you for his work yeah exactly because you're not you're never going to be as good as him at what he does and not to say that you couldn't do it but the stress level that you would have to have to try to do it is not worth you doing it it's better that you go to the original person and, and there's no, the, the, see everybody who wants, like the, there's this thing with competition. I don't know that competition is as, like it used to be. Mm-hmm. Like it used to be, you didn't even talk to the guy in your own town. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, like if there's a guy in your town that paints, you, you, you. That's why it's hard for me to get other painters in Dallas to come on this podcast is they think it's all a competition. I'm like, dude, like it's we're, not. we're not a competition together, dude. Like, trust me, my work is not coming from here. No. <laughs> it's like, you can have this shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can totally, like, I, I feel the same way. Like, I had, um, I had a client one time ask me to paint a motorcycle for him. This is a tattoo client. And I was like, man, I just don't want to. I was like, I, I don't have my shop set up right now. I don't. And I was like, he goes, well, I got a painter doing it, but his airbrush work isn't that good. And I was like, 
when I was looking at his work, I was like, well, he can graphics like a motherfucker. Mm -hmm. I was like, why don't you tell him to do all the graphics and just open me a window? I'll throw my airbrush on there. And, and there, you got it. Yeah. And, uh, and you, I've never had anyone think that was a good idea. Like, the, as far as from the other painter's perspective. Because for some reason, it, they don't want me to put airbrush on it. And if it was the other way around, I would be like... Phew. Yeah. If, if somebody was like, hey, Ryan, uh, uh, I got this buddy who does his really badass tape out graphics. I know you're painting my bike, but can he throw down? Yeah. I would be like, hell yeah. Like, let's do it. No. I, I, in fact, I would like, let's do it in my shop if I had still had my shop. You know, yeah. I, you know, like. That kind of stuff is fun. I mean, which is cool now because you can look at like a, a painter in his style and be like, man, like what I do good, whether it is airbrush or maybe it's monochromatic, like black over silver or some shit like that. I, I, I love to collab with these things, you know, but it's, um. I don't know if the money is like a lot of the jobs don't quite have the money attached yeah, to them. To, that's probably right. You know, I, I mean, I really wasn't even doing that for the money. I, it was just a, it, yeah. I, t I tattooed him. He wanted my artwork on his bike. It was that simple. I was just like, yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know what, like in the custom paint world, man, like there's no, like we're in a weird transitionary transitionary period where like things have been this way for so long and people are like still doing it, but they're kind of getting over it. And, like I, I've kind of talked to a lot of people about this, but you know, like uh, like the the helmet graphics that you would see, like on like um, race car helmets and shit like that, mm -hmm. is becoming a really popular style that's getting blended into the custom paint of like paneling and mm -hmm. and other shit. And um, it's really to me, it's like super exciting because it's a new style of doing graphics. And I'm looking at all my old tricks and how I can like turn this new style and blend it in with my other shit that I know how to do, you know, and make something that's... You know what I think would be would pop right now? And I was just talking about this today. Um, my dad, when I was a kid, he used to do custom paint. He still does, but when I was a kid, he was real heavy in it. And um, everything that he painted, if I showed you pictures, it was so distinctly late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. Very, very distinct. I'll bet if you started doing that shit... Exactly Dude. like he used to do it. Like he used to do these things. Remember this thing called a slime truck? So it was a mini truck. Mm -hmm. And he would take and make it look like it was covered in green slime. But it was very graphic-y. Like yeah. it was just drips all over it. <laughs> and it was so, it was purple and green like Joker. Yeah. And, um, and it had regular mini truck graphics. You know those old school mini truck graphics? Mm -hmm. Like early 90s? with the slime on it. I'll bet you if you did that today, it would just like... Yeah, I think it will too. I think um, I think that's what's what's going on now. It's, just, it's like when you look at anything, like when, when the panel thing came back, it came back with a modern technology flair to it mm -hmm. in some aspects. And I think the same thing about like that 80s and that... Well, they're doing it right now. Look at the, the Thor Ragnarok. Look at the logo. Yeah. It's that, uh, that synth wave type shit. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. Dude, I love that, that type of You can of bring that back right now. You know, I had, a, I had a, a, a guy that wanted me to do it, you know, and he actually listened to his podcast. And I just, you know, he, he wanted to do his bike. I just couldn't see it as a paint job. Go look at the 90s stuff, the mini trucks. Like, well, the mini truck stuff, but the synth wave, that, that Tron looking shit with the... Oh, yeah. That. No, I, just, I would go just full board. Like, I wish I was wearing that shirt right now. Like, I have a friend. He's in a band called Strip, Strip Wired. It's a... Very, very, they're in a ACDC tribute band called Back in Black, and then they have a second band called Strip Wired. Um, and their logo is so fucking cool, and it's just like lightning bolts with yeah. like some like ACDC kind of lettering or with blue lightning bolts through mm -hmm. it. It's so fucking 80s and 90s and shit, <laughs> but it, it's like, dude, like I would, I would see now I'm not painting anymore, but I would without reservations like just go full on into that like look it'd be cool to you know what sucks is there's not a lot of places to go see those type of paint jobs anymore like you really gotta have old magazines old low riders and old mini trucking magazines yeah dude they're everywhere um i actually been dude i want to go i've been trying to you know my wife uh you know she has a lot of family up in oklahoma city and stuff and i've been really wanting to go up there and talk to charles and a bunch of other oh, people dude, charles has yeah it. he's fucking like didn't he win like the uh like Painter a, of the century or he got a or he got like a lifetime achievement yeah so it's like a hall of fame yeah yeah yeah, hall of fame like guy. yeah, yeah mini yeah. truck and hall of fame and 
Dude, he built some of the sick. He painted some of the sick. He was ones. the guy that I, I've told. I said this last time on your yeah. podcast. He was the guy when I was a kid that, and you know, gave me the most inspiration. And um, my dad was painting at the same time, mm-hmm. and so like you know, like I said, uh, guys in the same town didn't talk or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so I didn't know who he was. I just saw his trucks when I would go to look at my dad's trucks, and uh, but dude, that would be so rad to bring that back. Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's kind of like part of, you know, like us people that are still painting and doing this stuff is kind of like our job at certain levels to be innovative a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. to, and I don't, I I hate to say it like that, but you know, just trying to do something. I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is make this shit fun for me continually and add a style to it. You know, like I can't, the, the panel lace thing, when I started doing all that shit, it was cool. It was like, fuck, man, this is so much easier than beveling edges and, right. and fucking covering the whole top side of a bike with airbrush. Like, you mean I just lay this on it and shoot through it and everybody goes, wow, how'd you do that? I'm like, yeah, awesome. Made a lot of money. It was fun. But there's only so many sets of fish scales and lace paint jobs that you can do before you're like, okay, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. Like... This is this is not you know I'm, this is not a legacy I'm leaving behind you know what I mean? Well, I mean, when you're doing something that's a trend, it's always gonna it's, it's a wave. It's gonna come in and go out. Um, so you're either gonna ride it or. Well, I think what I what I tried to look at is like, yes, it is a trend that I jumped on, but as I learned and got like the skills to do that thing down, like okay, now now I got the skills. All right, like, how do I make this, like, mine and not somebody else's? You know what I mean? So then you start looking at these tricks and you think about the old things you used to do and the things that you're interested in now. And you start blending these styles together. And then, you know, you kind of get some different looks, you know. Like, like our panel jobs became much different than most people's because we use a lot of points in it. And a lot of panel jobs are, like, just round corners oh, everywhere. Right, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's crazy to think just something simple like that. But... Yeah. It looks completely different. It's almost like... It's one of those things, ask any painter mm-hmm. who paints flames, they'll all tell you they do the best flames. <laughs> yeah. They do. Every painter, would, they think their flames are the best flames. In the end, it's just subtle variations of the exact same thing. Yeah. But it doesn't make it not cool. That, I mean, this, everyone has a flavor, you know? My dad used to have a lot of pride in his flames and... Um, everybody I've ever met <laughs> that does flames, they think their flames are the best. Yeah. But, you know, like, that's cool though. You know, like, that's why there's different, there's a, there's a million people, billion people in this world, billions and billions. There's a, there's a flame for everyone. <laughs> like, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was joking with a lot of people, but I'm kind of serious, man. I, I wish Real Fire would make a comeback because I used to make why, so much it's easy fucking fuck? money. Yeah. It's like, dude, I used to You know go- what's funny is how easy it is when you're good at it, mm-hmm. but there are so many people that suck at it. You it's know, like, it's almost like you could literally do anything and that shit looks good. That's what I'm saying. Yet there's so many people that are terrible. You want to know how people do bad jobs at it? Is they try too hard. Yeah, that must be it, huh? It, it's like you get in there and you're like, and, and you start thinking and you start thinking like a structured flame. And so you'll see people's flames and it's like- They'll do. They'll start doing like comfort. Yeah, strokes. they're just like they're just like C pattern, C pattern, C. You know, with like they'll, yeah. they'll use like um, Lavalle's uh, like stencils, stencils yeah. and they'll just without ever. This is the same when I teach my portrait class. The biggest thing that you have to get out of people's head is um, well, I do monochromatic class now, but um, the biggest thing you got to get out of people's head is like there's a reference this came from somewhere yeah what, and what, how come you don't have any fire pictures anywhere yeah like did you even look at fire or are you looking at Craig Frazier's technique or not Craig well Craig Frazier but also uh, yeah. Michael Valley well I think what people did is they would buy those uh, stencils and they would because it's easy to just go down a whole side of a car yeah but you know yeah when you look at like you know anytime you sit at a campfire just start taking snaps of it you know and like you'll see the licks you'll see 
if you you do it that way, you get much more of that Mike Lavalley esque kind yeah, of when look. When fire was hot, I can't tell you how many nights I would stare at the campfire. Yeah, and I would just try to learn it. I'd actually watch the flame leave the base. See, there's the also fire. there's also that other like stylized stuff that I like. It's kind of like that smoky Ribbon. wisp kind of thing. I know, um, like Darren Wenzel does it a lot on his mm-hmm. stuff, where he'll kind of bring it from behind a graphic yeah. and give. Give it a shadow. Yeah, put a shadow on fire. I think fire does have a shadow. Look in the look on the ground when fire's lit. Yeah, it does. Yeah. But you know, and I think that's it's like it's like, yeah, it's not real fire look, but it has that it, it just looks good with the paint job. So it's like you can go off the, the beaten path with like not being realistic and have a stylized look that's still cool. And I think guys like Darren Darren does a good job at that and Darren has uh, really like, cool stuff. You used to do a lot of Alan that. Alan Pastrana has some nice ribbon yeah, fire. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, you used to do, like, when you would do, uh, like, that little smoke look, man. It looks cool. The black smoke stuff. Yeah. It's fucking awesome stuff. Yeah, it's, that's something I stole from Corey St. Clair. <laughs> I actually did have an original idea for it. I started putting fire inside the black smoke. Mm-hmm. So, um, I'm just going to say I started it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who really was the first yeah. one, but I know I made it up. Yeah, it's Whether a- I was one of 10,000 people that made it up, I don't know. Yeah, there's there's lots of different ways, but like I said, man, it is cool that or I think it would be cool if like like you know those kind of man. I used to I used to literally get off work at a paint shop and I would go to somebody's shop. I remember one Saturday morning I went to this guy's shop and he had a Dodge Viper, like a like a 07, 08 Dodge Viper, right? And I came in, he wanted the now and then shit, right? A, a regular set of flames with fire behind it. Oh yeah. And I had been doing this shit so much that I, I literally laid out the entire flame job on the front half of this car, taped it off, did all the fire, pulled the tape off, and pinstriped the whole thing in one day. Yeah, because you're efficient. Yeah, it's just like you get used to doing that shit so much. Well, that's how I've gotten with portraits, mm-hmm. which is crazy to me that I still don't get enough of them. But, um, well, you know what's funny? When I was doing portraits on motorcycles, I did, I did a Batman bike, and next thing I know... I'm doing portraits. That's all I get. I get yeah. nothing else for five years. Yeah. And then um, I'm trying to, and I thought I thought I had the recipe for pigeonholing myself, you know, because mm-hmm. like, like people are like, oh, I don't want to be a one trick pony. I'm sitting here like, I do. Like, yeah. I want to do port, I, you know, and um, so I do the, I do one or two portraits here and there and then nothing, crickets. Oh, my tattoos. Oh, Like, yeah. uh, I thought I had the formula. I was like, okay, well, I'll do one free portrait for somebody. I'll put it up on my Instagram, and then I have portraits for days. Yeah, and it even, did not happen. I don't even know, like, And I know I, that portrait. Like, it's on Faith. I did a portrait of, yeah. uh, what was his name? Vincent Price. Vincent Price on Faith that I still look at. And I'm like, damn, that's fucking good. Yeah. And it, nothing. It's, I, I really don't, I've never thought about this, but I've never really looked into, like, how, what is the real good strategy for marketing tattoo work? I mean... For me, like with the paint work, like if I want to get into like a certain scene or genre, I can just do a couple ones super, super fucking crackhead cheap, knock them out of the park, and then now I got seven, you know, seven works of art to, to use as advertisement. You well, know with I mean? tattoos, you kind of have to stick to those themes. Well, first of all, there's people that are doing like, um, what's hot right now is people that are doing like um, graffiti inspired. It, it was once called trash polka. Now it's called like just people just make a mess, really, mm-hmm. but creative mess, and yeah. and and uh, that's real hot right now. I don't know what the name of it is. It's like, but then there's some people who are adding um, uh, what is it uh, like triangles and squares and oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and um, to me that's cool. That's I mean, like I don't want to. Eighties art, man. It, yeah, it's it's definitely something that's probably going to go in and out. Yeah. Uh, just because it's, um, it's too distinct and it's too it's it wasn't there a few years ago and mm-hmm. it's here now. So that tells you something. It's probably gonna. Yeah, it's weird. You know, if you think about it, man, like think about how quickly the style or what's popular changes. You it know, does change. By the time you're good at it, it's, yeah. du- it's so, someone else has changed I mean, it. you were airbrushing around the same time that like all the Day of the Dead chick blew up. The, everything right. was fucking Day of the Dead. Everybody yeah. wanted Day of the Dead. Paint jobs, tattoos, clothes, everything was about that shit. And yep. then 
that kind of morphed into what's that style where it's basically like the chick but they got the headdress on with the oh, see that yeah. one's on its way out too yeah that's so cool. it went well and i remember when i started doing it my motivation was i wanted an excuse to do portraits mm -hmm. so um and i think this is true with anyone who does it you know you want an excuse to do portraits so back in the day you would do a day of the dead girl mm -hmm. because the thing about doing a day of the dead girl is it's still a sexy chick but nobody's trying to recognize her yeah exactly so you're not she's got makeup on she's a character now so i was like okay so i'm first of all i'm not mexican so i don't know anything about the culture i yeah. barely know what the holiday is so i don't want to fringe on anything i was like so what if i did something native inspired but i don't want to infringe on the culture either so i don't want to do like a woman in a headdress infringing on yeah the native american culture so what if I'm inspired by it? And that's when we started doing like a girl wearing a a wolf yeah. on her head or or some variation of something that represents something native yet is not identif I any culture. Yeah. Um and now even that is kind of, you know, running its course. Yeah. So that's why now people are doing um a lot of, uh, I don't even know what they're doing. They, like, one thing I'm seeing a lot of is where they'll, like, take someone's face and do, like, half of it as, like, a oil painting and the other half is, like, dot work. Uh, and then, like... It's just all types, different types of abstract people, type shit. People are trying to make it abstract because everyone's trying to do something different yet still get away with doing what they like. Yeah. So you have to, but that's if you want to do like portrait based things. But then again, if you're doing pocket watches and crosses and stuff like that, there's still going to be a big market. You don't for have those to make it yet. creative. No, you don't. If you're doing a, if, okay. So if you want to do portraits, for instance, or, or, um, if you want to do something like that, well, you have to make it creative. So that's why people are doing these neon things and making them look like stickers or making them look like, um, they're, they're doing anything to make it look creative extra they're doing extra yeah. to it meanwhile it's not required of a pocket watch yeah because it already has everything it needs because of what it is so you don't have to add anything to it mm -hmm. is like any of the traditional type stuff still popular is it oh yeah 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 traditional is here to stay traditional is traditional it's it, it'll always be you know it's always been uh, black and gray is the same like black and gray realism it's always been it always yeah. will be um, certain types of those types of tattoos are timeless what about like the uh, you know like what's you know I ended up getting a uh, an iPad Pro and I've been doing a lot of drawing and sketching on that thing a lot it's been helping me with my renderings like hugely and stuff but you know when they do those like cartoon style you know I don't know what the, the right term is but when they, it's like basically the, all the shadows of the face and it's like you know, it's almost like the, I think we might have even talked about this last time, but the, the Grand Theft Auto type of artwork. Oh, that's uh, vector art. Vector art. So yeah, that style, I think that's it's like, I want to do some paint, like airbrush painting on the helmets like that, that has that kind of vectored out looking art on it. All you, know you know do I mean? need is layers of stencils. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty much it. Um, but I just, it's just, it's like, even though it's not, it's nothing... Like, it's not like, oh, fuck, how'd you do that? Like, that's so real. It's not like some it's Marvel. It's just style. a new type of art to put on put on there and show it off, you know, and it makes it kind of different, you know. I, I think that shit looks cool. I, I don't know. I, honestly, trying to stand out is still a mystery to me. I all, Like I said, I, all I know to do is just be as technically good as possible. I, I Man, I don't even know. Like, you know, since we've been sitting down, I've been just trying to, like... You've been listening, but I've been thinking of like angles of like how how do you market yourself in that in the tattoo community and well I think there's there's something for everyone like there's some people who really enjoy uh, graffiti mm -hmm. they should be tattooing graffiti you know me on the other hand I really enjoy technically being as precise as possible yeah so if you come to me for a portrait of your family member for instance you know it's going to look like mm -hmm. them. That's that's kind of where I... So I don't try... I, I kind of stay in my lane on that. Yeah. Like, 
I add pieces of flair. Like I understand composition. I understand S curves. I understand that there's certain ways things should lay on the body to complement the body. Mm -hmm. And so I try to compose them as best as I can. But when it comes to marketing myself, I think my angle is that like, like I want to where, you know, my goal is to be the type of person's like, holy fuck, how in the hell did he do that yeah, with a yeah. tattoo machine? And that's why I want to, I want to be that person you can trust. If it's your dog, you know, and you want a portrait of your dog, yeah, come to me, I will do it. And I will make sure that it is correct. It'll look exactly like your dog. It'll be unmistakable. Now, if you want graffiti, go to someone else. Mm -hmm. That's fine. It doesn't hurt my feelings. Yeah. You know, like, um, well, I think that's the, that's the thing though. Like, uh, I deal with it a lot in the paint world now because a lot of the people are, are used to like, especially the older guys that kind of have the money to do this shit. They're used to the early two thousands where they went to one painter to get everything. Right. Like, you know, this is my painter. He paints all my bikes. This is who I go to. So that guy would be like, all right, man, I want to do a graffiti bike this time. And then that painter would like either try it himself or he would hire a graffiti guy to come in, mm -hmm. you know? And nowadays it's like, I think a lot of us are like, hey, man, I don't do that stuff. I don't do filigree. I don't do this. I don't do that. You know, what you see on my Instagram is what I have to offer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I'm selling. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know I mean? and I think clients should be that way. I, I don't think if you don't do art for a living or if you don't do art at all, I don't think people fully understand that there are better people for certain things. Yeah. Like, and that's really what and it you is. should be willing to travel to that person. Like. Some for some reason, and I get this in Oklahoma a lot. So all you Oklahoma people that are listening, I'm three hours away, yeah. yet people can't seem to get in their car and drive three hours. Now there's a lot that do, but there's a lot that don't. Yet I got people flying in from Florida, yeah, for just to come. They fly in, they come to an appointment, they get back on a plane, and they leave. I think that has a lot to do with the uh, the the mentality of the people that you're local to. You know, like when you grow up with. Like, I feel like people here in Dallas, they, I, I can never get the kind of money I get from everybody else out of town. So that's why, like, I stopped carrying business cards. I don't have a sign on my door at my shop. I'm like, man, like, all my work comes from everywhere else. The one, the few people that do come to me locally, it's, you know, it's kind of more of an understood of, you know, what we're doing. But it seems like people here will send a bike to Arizona pay twelve, thirteen thousand dollars to get it painted. But before they sent it there, they didn't want to pay my price, which was maybe eight or nine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because they're sitting out of town, they feel like it's it's worth more. Yeah. You know? Well that, that's that's the nature of everything. I mean, why is a Rolex cost what it does? Like um, it's for some reason there's value on it that has yeah. been put on it. And that's what, that's what I'm saying. Like, what, I wonder what the mentality is. I don't know if, is it bragging rights? Like, Oh man, I got this done from out of town. So it's like a different or, or possibly, you know, or maybe that's just, they did what we've talked about before where they wanted something very specific. Mm -hmm. Now I've seen on the flip side where I'll be tattooing somebody and they, they're talking about their friend goes to wherever, mm -hmm. you know, flies to go get their tattoo done. And, you know, I don't want to act like, I don't want to be misunderstood when I say this, but I'll see the tattoo come back and I'm like, yeah. shit, like, you could have brought that to me. Like, I think what's scary about tattoos is like when you do see all these badass ones online, maybe it goes back to what we were talking about when we first started. It's like fuck man if I'm gonna pay all this money for this badass guy I want that that's that's the only you reason you should yeah, yeah yeah like for instance there's there's tattooers that are on my bucket list I'm not gonna want anything other than what they're badass at I'm yeah. not gonna bring my like life story to them yeah. like if there's somebody that's on my bucket list that does um you know Mexican inspired artwork well that's what I'm gonna get yeah you know what I'm saying like I want that I want what I like <laughs> Going in like, hey, I want some Scottish shit. Man. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. But th that's, I, I think that's a good thing, man. Like, there, there are some artists, like, for instance, when, when Franco did this one on my wrist, mm -hmm. it's a, people listening, it's a sculpture. I don't even know who the sculpture's of, but Franco's really good at sculptures. And he yeah. wanted to do a sculpture, 
So I just picked a sculpture that looked good. Mm -hmm. I don't even know anything about it, but I, I just wanted his artwork, and he's fucking rad. Yeah, it's just crisp. It's a little too. He did a single needle, one needle. Damn, that's some. So he just shit. he just like poked it like this. Well, it was in a machine, but he poked it. Pop, 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 pop. Damn, dude, it's rad. But you can, that's the 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 single needles. You can get pretty good detail with it, though, right? Like, yeah, yeah. But it's a it's an art form. It's yeah. like. It's kind of one of those things like the old school cats do it. It's actually coming back in the form of three liner work, but I think they're going even to single needle yeah. where it's like people want that pepper shading. Yeah. They want it to look like a tattoo and not like this one's three liner work. But um, yeah, I think that's super fucking rad. <laughs> I don't know why, why we were talking about that, but yeah. Um, it, yeah. But no, that, that is cool. Hey, it looks really good, man. Yeah, I was telling her earlier, I was like, I don't fuck, man, I haven't had a tattoo in like six years. And like, I don't, I don't, I don't follow it as much. Like I, I follow tattoo artists when I see work, I'm like, oh, that's good. But I'm not in the market for anything. Like I don't have anything in my head. Like I got a couple ideas, but it's I'm, ideas I've had for like 10 years that I just haven't like. I'm finally getting to a point where I'm like, all right, I'm ready to get fucking covered. Like yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm 35. I'm like, I, when I was younger, I was like saving. Mm hmm you know i'm saving, saving myself. your space i'm yeah. saving myself a little bit <laughs> yeah and now i'm just like fuck it just let's fucking cover this shit that but, shit fucking hurts man <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah but it's one of those things there's something about getting tattooed the pain of tattooing is somehow enjoyable even though it sucks i guess i guess for me you know like i'm fucking ridiculously out of shape now so it's like i don't look at my body go fuck yeah i want to get a tattoo right there it's like no i want to lose weight like more than I want to get a tattoo, but beer is so fucking good. So it's like, you know, it's like I'm in that phase where it's like, I, I don't know, like. I just gave that up. Yeah. For the 10,000th time, but <laughs> but I, I think I'm going to do it this time. There you go. I feel good about it. Man, I I, I don't know. I just heard, uh, I was listening to, what's his name's podcast? Um, shit, Bill Burr. Uh-huh. And he was talking about like 17 weeks or some shit he hasn't drank. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. He speaks my language because he was talking about like, uh, he was like, all these fucking AA guys like yeah. trying to get me to do AA. I don't need your fucking group so I can quit drinking. And I'm just like, yeah, I can do it on my own. I can do this shit on my own. I can control myself. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, I, you know, I think about it a lot. I mean, I don't, I guess you don't realize, like for me, I haven't realized how dependent on drinking I, I've become. You know, Me and too. it's like, it's like, it just dulls the senses just enough. Like I don't, I don't get shit faced all the time. You know what I mean? But I do it. It like you, you have a couple beers at night and you're like, fuck man, today's over with. And now I'm not yeah. thinking about it anymore and I'm chill. Start smoking weed. <laughs> Dude, I try, man. I just can't like, you know, like I just got off probation finally in January. So it's like, I, you know, the bartender at our little bike night gave me a nice fucking great smelling you know some flour and shit and i was like cool took it home ripped it and i haven't smoked in like two and a half years and i was fucking like dead dude i was just <laughs> like you know and then um you know i was like man like it you know i was kind of putting off chilling on drinking like as soon as i'm on probation i'm gonna start smoking weed again and i won't want to drink anymore and it's just not the same like weed to me i just, don't like smoking weed any any I, like i really actually hate smoking weed mm -hmm. but i'm trying to learn <laughs> like, now, the, like, yeah. I wanna, like we've got these uh, little um the, the vape pens yeah the vape pens yeah so i like those because those don't put me on my ass well i was hitting faiths the other day and it was just like i was taking the smallest tokes i could mm -hmm. and i was and i was it was it was all right i wasn't like feeling like hell Dude, so, if I yeah, when I do the vape pen, my wife has one. I'm I'm it mellows me out a little bit, but it's like a a fucking micro dose of weed, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then like when I go just hit just one toke on a bowl, I'm like fucking yeah, gone, yeah, dude. Yeah. And I'm like, and you get that fucking fire lung going on. You're like, yeah, this is gonna be great. And then you're like, two minutes later, you're just like, everything's going slow and shit. You're like, fuck, man, I'm done. I want to get good because it's still like okay, so. I'm what? How many I days? Wanna, I want to do it. It's been like four or five days, not even that I've stopped, stopped drinking. drinking. Oh, dude. Yeah, yeah. But okay, so it. I immediately the same day. Uh huh. What was? What was I recognized reason? how hard it was. The what was the reason why? Like you wanted to stop, or you're trying to stop? Well, I've been working with a trainer for uh, almost three months, mm -hmm. and I'm getting all these changes. Like I'm 
getting more stronger. I'm getting muscles that I've never felt before. And yet my body fat has not changed at all. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm, when I work out in the morning, like this dude works me the fuck out. Mm -hmm. Not to mention I eat a pretty decent diet. Like I, you know, I have tortillas or whatever, but honestly there ain't shit in my diet that's bad. Yeah. So I was talking to my trainer about it and I told him, I was like, man, cause I'm already vegan. So I already have like a restrictive diet. So I like, I was telling him, I was like, what can I do? Because I don't want to stop eating tortillas because mm -hmm. that's all I got. You mm -hmm. know that you I mean as a vegan, if you're trying to eat abundance of food, like if you're trying to cook at home, for instance, mm -hmm. I'm not going to make a gourmet meal every day. Yeah. So most of the time I'm taking a bunch of vegetables and I'm putting it in a wok and I'm making like veggies and yeah. beans and shit. That's not awesome every day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when you get to stick it in a tortilla and make different variations of burritos or different variations of sandwiches, that makes it enjoyable. So I was telling him, I was just like, I can't cut something like that out. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be low carb or anything like that. And that conversation led to, um, he goes, well, there's drinking. And I was like, there's drinking. And he goes, I'll bet you. <laughs> cause I was, cause we're going through my diet. I was like, I just don't want to quit too many things. And he was like, well, you could start running every night, like five miles a night or whatever. He goes, or you could stop drinking. And I was like, that is something I could do without. I, I don't want to give up my burritos, but I, I'll give up. <laughs> I could give up drinking. And yeah. he goes, so he said the magic word to me because I'm kind of a, I respond well to challenges. So um, I'm competitive, I guess. So uh, we got down into a, you know, I was doing a, a, a leg press. Yeah. So he's telling me, I'm like, I can do it. I think I can do it. No, I can do it. No, I think I can do it. No, I can. I think I can do it. And I get down in the leg press and then he looks at me and he goes, I fucking challenge you to do it. I <laughs> bet you can't do it. Or he didn't say, I bet you can't do it. He goes, I fucking challenge you. Mm -hmm. And he just said it the right way that I was like, shit, I'm going to do it. And so I've been good. So that same, um, cause I don't want to waste all that. Like I'm working yeah. hard every morning, like every morning, dude, I'm busting my ass with this trainer and I need to have some, give me a fucking six pack then, Jesus. And if, it, if I have to get rid of a six pack to get a six pack, I'll, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. So that's why I'm doing it. But like, I'll tell you the first day, um, that first day I was with my um, client and he wanted to go eat um, fajitas at the next door place. And the, ne the place next door has a lot of margaritas. Mm -hmm. And if you're eating a fajita, you better have a Corona or a margarita, yeah. you know? And I got the veggie fajitas and that, um, we were looking at, <laughs> he was like, you want to get some margs? But I was just like, damn dude, like, no, I'll have water. <laughs> like, I don't even know how to eat fajitas without yeah, yeah. margarita or Corona. So that was hard. Then the next day me and Faith went to, um, uh, where'd we go? Blue Goose. Mm -hmm. And they have these badass impossible. It's got yeah, the impossible, impossible meat. Yeah. yeah. But it's a tacos. Is that meat any good? Fuck yeah. It is? Dude, if I gave you these tacos, the Impossible Tacos from Blue Goose, and yeah, I didn't say that, a word. They had that meat too at, uh, at like, I think Freebirds does that meat too. Yeah, Freebirds, they had potatoes in it. It tastes oh, like shit. I mean, it's good, but it, it's it's like it's like cutting your cocaine with fucking Comet. It's <laughs> good. <laughs> they had potatoes in there. But um, they, um, or should I say cutting your weed with oregano? I don't know. Is that <laughs> it's probably the whatever? Same yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. Okay. But anyway, but that's what they, they had potatoes to it. But at uh, Blue Goose, that shit is a fat fucking taco full of the impossible meat. So if I brought that in here yeah, you would be and never said a word, you would eat it and you'd be like, damn, this is good whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So um, but anyway, when we were there, they had like a little, you know, little ads on the table for mm -hmm. margaritas again. And I was just like, Blue Goose, that's seen Blue Goose used to be my, uh, my, when I used to date, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That was my, like, you go there, the margaritas are super strong. So yeah, you that's why I wanted they're, them, because they were so fucking strong. They're cheap. So you go there, you get, the first one's hard to go down, you know, it's because it's strong. The rest go down like it ain't nothing. Yeah, yeah. And then so do the girls' panties when they come back. <laughs> <laughs> it always worked, dude. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but no, like, you know, the, the drinking thing, man, it's, uh. I did good, though. We didn't drink. Yeah. It's. I, dude, I, I've done the keto thing like twice now and I lose about 30 pounds over about two months, you know, of doing it. And then 
I always do it in the winter time because it's easier because we don't do as much, right? Mm-hmm. But then next thing you know, it's like what's been fucking me up is that we have a bike night that we do every Tuesday in Deep Ellum, and when I go there, I'm like, all my friends are there. We're all sitting down. They're all drinking. It's like fuck it, I'll have a beer, and you know what I mean. So mm-hmm. so it fucks up my. What I was doing when I did the keto thing the first time was I would go, I'd do like a two week thing of no drinking to really get into ketosis finally. Mm-hmm. And then finally, like one day, I'll have one day where I'd, I'd, I'll still eat keto all day, but I'll have some beer, right? And then I won't do it anymore for another week or so. And then I would do it like that and I could drink still. So I only drink two or three times a month, but I would lose weight, you know what I mean? Go yeah. down. but. I, we just do so much shit and we're so social it's hard to i'm anxious to see what change because if the, for as much as i'm working out mm-hmm. if because like i said i've been doing it for nearly three months mm-hmm. with the only time off i took is when i was in california i went i did detroit for a week and then california for a week i was off for two weeks but other than that i was pretty good for three months and like i said i've got all these new muscles yeah <laughs> But I've got fat on top of them, and I'm like, all right. So now it's a controlled environment. So if I've stopped drinking now, so if in another month I've lost weight, I'll know exactly what the fuck it's been this whole time. Mm-hmm. But if in another month I haven't lost weight, I mean, I'm still going to try to quit drinking, but at least I can, I'll know that there's something else that I'm doing. Yeah, we, my wife actually, she started getting those like seltzer water things that are like alcohol and they're like super low carb, super low calorie, like less than three carbs and like super small count, like 30 calories or some shit. Mm-hmm. And it's just kind of like, a, like if you're not drinking at all, for me, it's like, fuck, I'll take one of those. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's good. It gets me a little buzz and I'm feeling great. But um, it, dude, it's, I don't know, man. Like it's hard to, it's, it's for me, it's hard, man. I want to stop, but at the same time, I don't have time to get onto a schedule of working out that's kind of been the other problem it's like i was like that too that's why i got a trainer yeah i i used to dude i thought about joining a crossfit thing like if i'm paying somewhere i have to be somewhere every day like okay i have to be there at 9 a.m to do this thing that i'm paying for i felt like that wouldn't be the motivation okay fuck i have to be there that's true when it's a gym i'm like i'll do it when i get off work like i bought a basketball too because you know i used to play basketball as a kid uh in high school and all that shit right and I was like, fuck, man, like if I just went and played around, got a little bit used to, you know, the coordination back a little bit, I could start pick, playing pickup games. And that's fucking a workout right there, dude. I've just, had more. I've had more changes in my few months with a trainer than I did in my because I've been off and on working on working out for at the gym for like, you know, 15 years or whatever. Those these last few months have been like as if those other ones didn't count. Mm -hmm. Like I did P ninety X, I went through the whole thing, and sure, I did really good with that, but uh, nothing like this, man. Because in P ninety X, even you can stop, yeah, like or you can fast forward through the exercise that you hate, yeah. But with the trainer, when he says you're doing eighteen fucking reps, you're doing eighteen fucking reps. It doesn't matter, like like that dude will have me where I'm like, I'll get on my first rep. And I can't get the fucking weight up or whatever he has me doing. I can't squat or whatever. But he'll make sure that I still get 18 of those same fucking things in. Mm. And there's something to be said about that. Like, if he says 18, he means 18. And I'll sit there. I'll be halfway through it going like, what the fuck, dude? Like, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at him like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> like, because my, my legs, like, they'll they'll completely stop working. Like, yeah. completely fucking dead. And he's, say, he's telling me, eight more. <laughs> and I'm like, are you fucking serious? And he's just looking at me with calm. Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. You can do it. Yeah. It's just in your mind, man. I'm like, fuck. But he died. Do it in the end. Yeah. And that's something you won't do on your own. Yeah, for sure. And I, like, I would like, we have the gym next door and I'd come down here and, uh, I'd be, you know, jogging on the treadmill, which I have no problem running. You know, I can't run, but I can jog, you know, <laughs> right mm-hmm. now until I get, until I lost some weight. But, um, then next thing you know, like, all of a sudden, like, gym is super tight in there. Like, it's like a couple things. There's only one area to lift weights. And I enjoy lifting weights. You know what I mean? Right. But it gets packed real quick. And it's like, ah, I don't oh, fucking really? want to be this in one? Yeah, dude. Uh-huh. Like, you'll be in there. And the next thing you know, it's like, there'll be people waiting to get on a treadmill. And I'm like, fuck, man. Like, I'm, I know I'm not using this to its full advantage. I feel like I should get out of the way for this other person. 
they want to run. He's back got me and, doing a lot of kettlebells and bands too. Yeah, yeah. Bands. I didn't realize how fucking badass those things are. Mm-hmm. He had me doing a band ex- exercise this morning that was just like fucking fire, dude. Fire. He'll have my legs so fucking lit that I swear, he, dude. I'm like, they're gonna fucking bust out of my fucking skin like <laughs> so much. But I love it. When I first, my first few days of working with him, it was fucking murder. Like I was like, I, my it was a client that told me I should get a trainer. Yeah. And that client I worked with after like day two or whatever. And I was like, I was asking him, I was like, telling him how hard it was. I was like, is your trainer work you out that hard? He was like, oh yeah. I was like, when does it get easy? He goes, never. Mm. I was like, what? Like it's this bad every day? He goes, yeah, but you'll start li- you'll start enjoying the, the, uh, the stress of it. Mm-hmm. You'll almost be like, if you don't, if you don't stress that much, you'll think you didn't do a full workout. So then I'm getting to that point now. The first few days I was like, I don't, this is, this is the craziest shit I've ever done. Yeah. Now I'm like, if we leave a workout, like today, he beat my ass today, but after I was done, I didn't feel like death. Mm-hmm. So I went and I ran Yeah. after my workout on my own. He didn't even ask it, me to. So I wanted to feel death again. Isn't the goal basically to find a way to make this a part of your lifestyle every day? Yeah, that's another thing, a trainer, because me and him, we work out 10 o'clock every day. Mm -hmm. Used to be I was, you know, getting ready for work around 10, and I'd always like, I can't get to the fucking gym, I can't make it to the fucking gym, I can't make it to the fucking gym. And so I would miss it and, Mm -hmm. and always have these excuses. And then now, that guy's waiting on me at 10 o'clock. I better Mm -hmm. fucking be there. I I sh- it can't be even two minutes late, three minutes late, which I'm about eight minutes late every day. But um, there's something mental about that. Mm-hmm. Where now it's again, we're almost three months in. It's routine now. I wake up without an alarm clock. I'm ready to go. The only thing that fucks me up is traffic. Mm-hmm. But like, um, even on my days off of work, where because of the gym is right next door to my job, so. Um, I'll drive even on my day off I'll drive all the way there to go to the gym because I don't want to miss it like mm. uh, I had to miss yesterday because there were some errands that I just didn't have time for and uh, so today at the end I was like dude can I do something this weekend I don't want to miss out yeah on anything and so um, I don't know man I recommend a trainer they're expensive for a good one but fuck are they worth it if you're trying to like finally like if you're at that point in your life where you're like I gotta do something yeah a trainer's way to go but if you don't have a crossfit it's probably good i, yeah, I, I thought about it. there's one right next to my shop literally like in the same complex and it's like there's a crossfit in our rv park for real mm-hmm. i don't know i thought it'd be fun but at the same time like i do enjoy playing basketball and if i could just find some middle-aged white men to play with yeah, yeah. i'd be good yeah, <laughs> yeah just a little activity yeah. is better than no activity what i didn't realize too is because we're artists, you know, so we're we're bent over our artwork all day long, mm-hmm. especially as a tattooer, because I'll spend 10 hours in a chair with a machine in my hand. And I was doing that. That's how I got so bad out of shape is because I was so obsessed with tattooing for so many years that um, I was putting a lot of stress. In fact, I hear that's sometimes as bad as smoking mm-hmm. is inactivity, you know, sitting in a chair all day. And so when he first started working me out it was shocking how bad out of shape i was yeah like i was i was like oh i I can't believe i can't fucking do this like just like normal activity and he was just like yeah dude that's what sitting in that chair is going to do to you so i think i mean it just proves that everyone that especially if you're an artist and you and you're hunched over your artwork all day long Mm -hmm. you better be in the fucking gym because your body's taking a toll dude (laughs) I was uh, I was on this bike trip out to Cali and we were leaving Vegas to head into Cali on 15 right there. And uh, one of my buddy's bikes broke down. So we were at a gas station and I went behind the gas station to go take a piss. And I was just standing there and I kept hearing something like I thought it was like a like a, some kind of animal out there making a noise. And I was like, looking. I was like, what the fuck is that? And then I caught myself breathing. I was I was wheezing while I was sitting there breathing. Right. Mm hmm. And I was like, what the fuck, man? Like, and this was like a couple of years ago. I was a lot skinnier than I am now. And it's like, it was just weird. That like, sound was your sound? It was my sound. <laughs> <laughs> like, I thought it was an animal out there just kind of running around in the, in the desert. And I was like, oh, it's me. I'm fat. I'm sorry. <laughs> dude, I'm telling you, man. Dude, get into that CrossFit. CrossFit, I guess, is a group activity. Yeah. The only thing that I've heard negative about it is that they're not... 
extremely focused on your posture because you're not getting that one-on-one -on -one attention mm -hmm. and you can throw your back out or something like like for instance i told my trainer right out of the gate i was like dude the last time i did deadlifts i did one with barely more than the barbell and i threw my back out and i was fucked for um ever yeah. and it was two months before my back was right or more yeah and so i so he was starting me on a deadlift exercise and i told him i was just like um I'm terrified of deadlifts. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, like, I'm scared, like actually scared of them yeah. because I got to work, you know, my, I got to, if I can't tattoo or I can't paint, you know, because of my back. And he was like, no. And he got me right. And he like stood there with me and he worked on my posture over and over and over and over until finally I got my posture right. And then he started adding weight slowly, adding weight slowly. And the next thing I know I was doing these heavy deadlifts. And then um, the next day, he asked me how I was doing. And I was like, I'm fine. He goes, see? And yeah. I didn't even, it didn't occur to me. He goes, you deadlift fucking heavy. And you're, you're great. And I was like, yeah. So that yeah, the, the, that one-on-one -on -one attention so somebody can say, you know, arch your back or put your shoulders back or, or, or wherever. Which, if you're in a group activity and you're doing deadlifts and there's not somebody to check you if your back is in the wrong position. Yeah. It, that thing will be gone and you're fucked. Mm-hmm. That's only thing. That's my only issue with CrossFit is just you have to be more focused on yourself and making sure your posture is correct. Yeah. Because I've heard a lot of people injure themselves. I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do. Dude, do you do CrossFit? I'm not trying to talk shit on it. I'm just <laughs> saying you got to be careful. Yeah, I think everything is about like, dude. You know, I, 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 I it's a complaint, right? You know what I mean? Just like everything else. But I'll wake up. I'll go to work. I do. You know the normal eight to 10 hours a day at the shop. And then I come home and I'm either doing a podcast or I'm sitting at the table sketching ideas and paint jobs out for hours. Mm -hmm. So my daily routine is like 9 a.m. to about six, seven or eight, depending on the workload. And then when I come home, it's two, at least two to three hours a night, almost sometimes just sketching, you know, shit. Yeah. And then sometimes it's like, you're like, fuck man, like, you know, then you got to try to fit podcasts in because now this is an actual part of my business now to where I, I have an obligation to get a certain amount done every month. And it just, it's just basically, I think for me, I'm trying to weed out certain things that aren't as profitable or, or as enjoyable and get to a point where I'm doing the things that I really enjoy and freeing up other time. You know what I mean? It's almost like the same way you would downsize your financial you know obligations right. yep. i'm trying to do that with my workload so that i can have a little bit more free time you know for myself to go play basketball you know that is important so, that is very important i think like, and so that's the and that, that i think that a lot of that has to do with the drinking too because you know sometimes i'll, I'll get in a slump like creativity wise like trying to design a paint job so when i do a sketch of an idea i can see it on paper and if I see it and I'm like, fuck, oh, that, I'm stoked. My whole mood, my whole everything in my life is just nice. It's great. But if I keep drawing sketches and drawing sketches and they just don't quite click, dude, it's it's that anxiety thing, man. It's like, fuck, man. Like, dude, am I good? I don't want to bomb on this paint job, you know, because I stopped taking in a lot of work. I only take in a little bit of work. So I want everything to be like fucking knocking out of the park. You know what I mean? Yeah, so that's the way it's I a lot more stressful. Tattoos. It yeah. is. I think being an artist in general, it's a stressful job because there's no written book on it. It's yeah. not like you can't go refer to the manual and and the and, and know that you did a good job. You either. It's. I always tell people, and, and clients don't fully understand this, and nor would they know the difference anyway. A lot of them, but. If you were to have to, like, if you were a musician and you had to write a hit song mm -hmm. every single day, that's yeah. a lot of pressure. And that's exactly. what I feel like as an artist. Like, yeah, you got to be on your best game every day and you're not going to be. So the stress of knowing that some days you just fucking don't hit it. Yeah. That's why I'm trying to narrow too. Like you were saying, narrow to your hits, play your fucking hits. Because at least you'll know you'll hit them consistently every time. That's what I'm well, trying to do. Well, it's also, it's for your mentality too, of like not stressing yourself out over the things that you're not quite ready to tackle yet, you know, in some aspects. So, um, 
it, it's it's kind of weird because like you know until like now with like podcasts and YouTube and things like that, most people didn't really have a, a perspective of how artists think about or how what they deal with when they're trying to be creative. You know what I mean? And it's it's like when people hit me up for paint jobs, it's like. And they'll deposit me and I'm like, all right, well, usually I would like want to wait till right before we're getting ready to paint the bike before we do the paint job. Because sometimes for myself, even if I draw a paint job for you now and we're a month away from doing the bike, I'm over it by the time we get to that paint job. I'm like, right. dude, I, I'm not in that mental space anymore. You know what I mean? Right. And then the other thing is it's, it, you know, it sucks because sometimes I'll, I'll procrastinate. And then it'll be last minute and I have to get something done. I have to pull something out of my ass. And then it's a, uh, it's a super stressful thing on that, that range. But it's weird, man. Like sometimes, and then I, I found that sometimes when I get down to do a drawing, if I have a beer to calm the nerves and then I can draw and I usually have better results. I used to be very dependent on alcohol mm -hmm. for creativity. Like my best work, the work I'm known for the most, I was by myself and drunk as fuck. Yeah, I used to, I used to, to, you know, when I was 25, 26, 27, uh, go buy a bottle of wine mm -hmm. and I would start painting and I knew the painting was done when it started going, seeing double. Yeah. Or I knew I was done for the night and I was so efficient at doing it that way that even my dad didn't argue with it. Like yeah. nobody was like, oh, you know, this is where Ryan gets drunk and he paints, but mm -hmm. by the morning time, there's some crazy shit he did, you know? But, uh, it's I like, it's like, there's a, there's a window for me, like a beer to like four beers. I'm good at painting, great at having conversations, great at a lot of things, but then you get past that and you just start getting a little retarded and that's where, you yeah, know, yeah. you know. Well, that's when you start fun. seeing double. Yeah. yeah, that's when you know, okay, Time to quit, and a lot of times I remember this is these are good memories though. <laughs> like I, I remember being by myself painting in the loft, um, and I drink bottles of wine, big bottles, of fucking mm -hmm. wine, and I'd start seeing double. Once I started seeing double, uh, or I couldn't focus on my painting, then I would quit. Mm -hmm. But I'd go downstairs and I'd keep drinking. Fuck yeah, I would keep drinking, play on the computer and wait to pass out. Well, I remember that night that I came and, you know, you showed me a lot of the tricks. Like, it was like 11 o'clock at night. You're like, dude, let's go to the fucking bar. So we went to the bar. Yeah, yeah. And drank like a couple of pitchers or some shit of beer and then went back and painted some more to like four in the morning. Yeah, yeah. That's how I always was. But so now I guess I have to learn how to. Uh... Well, actually, you know what? When I started tattooing, I used to drink a couple shots before I every tattoo just to calm down and get regular but when i started being more professional yeah. in a professional environment um you can't take two yeah. shots before a thing so i had to learn how to how to perform sober and now i just got to learn how to hang out with people sober <laughs> yeah, <that's good. laughs> but I'm, I'm all right with it i'm gonna try to do the art circus and not drink at all like the crazy like right before the art circus i think the weekend before is like our big camp out that we host yeah and so it's like we were thinking about bringing like three kegs <laughs> like it's just i mean i do enjoy drinking a lot i, I enjoy the uh, social aspect of it you know like i'm not you know i i guess i made the excuse now okay i have a beer or two here like to do drawing or artwork and stuff but um I also feel like, man, like back in the day, like when I used to go out and drink, I never, I didn't drink out as much. Now that I got forced to have to do it at home all the time, you know, because of getting a DWI at some point, now I'm yeah. scared to go anywhere and drink. Yep. I drink more. You know what I mean? Yep. Like I, I, I would drink, well, just the other day, like last weekend, you know, this is before I made my decision, but um, Faith was out of town. I had the day off. And I had a, and I was like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with myself? Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know what to do. I was like, so I just drank a bottle of vodka by myself. <laughs> and I just watched TV, or I played video games, drank vodka. But it kind of, <laughs> this is one of those things. Like, I don't drink. That's another thing. I'm not the kind of person, and anyone that knows me knows this. I don't drink one beer. I don't take two shots. Mm -hmm. I drink all the beer and all the shots. <laughs> like, I only, so like... 
I I don't know. This is something I need in my life. I have to stop. If I, I, I definitely. You know, sitting here talking with you, it's like I, I've been thinking, you know, because I would talk with my brother a lot. It's like, man, we used to we used to stay up here and work. A 12-hour day was every day, you know, and it was like, and now I'm realizing it is my energy level is not there as it used to be. So I don't have the energy to stay in the shop and continue to work all day. Like I, after six, seven, or after about an eight-hour day or close to an eight-hour day, I'm like, fuck, man, I'm tapped. You know, I'm thinking about doing kind of a, a reward style thing. Like, um, that's what I was thinking about doing. Like, well, my client that the one that convinced me to to uh, get a trainer, his wife is training for a uh, competition, mm-hmm. um, a physique competition, and they're going to they their their thing that they do is they go to um, I forget which island out in the you know the middle of the Gulf of Mexico or somewhere. I forget what, which island they go to, but, um, they, she can't, she can't eat anything outside of her diet. She can't drink anything outside of her diet because mm-hmm. she's got to win this physique and he does the same thing. And, um, but they reward themselves when they go to this island. Granted by that time, it takes them like one beer to get drunk. Yeah. But, that's their reward and i was thinking maybe we could do the same thing where it's like if i can get a if i can get a handle mm-hmm. on my drinking it doesn't mean i have to quit outright but if there's a like maybe if i'm in this town or this city that's or maybe this island i'm allowed to drink mm-hmm. under these circumstances only yeah and if but you got to earn your drink you got to earn it that's yeah. what he said he earns it because by the time they get to the island because she'll she will have done the competition a week before or whatever, so she will have worked her ass off for however many months it takes to get into that kind of shape, and then they get to the island looking their best. Yeah. And they get to party without guilt. You know, that's that's to me that's a, like a legit like. That's, for, for me, like for me, it's a two week period. If you can get past the two week period of not drinking, mm-hmm. it becomes easier to get in the habit of not doing it. Because like at two weeks, it's like you you'll like especially when I was doing the keto thing, like that's when you would really start seeing weight kind of coming off. So when the weight starts coming off, you're like, "Fuck, man, that's it's working." Like you're mm-hmm. motivated to continue to do it. Um, but like I said, the difference for me now is just so much social shit going on. And now it's like even when I do podcasts, it's like uh, some of the guests we have on, it's like they want to drink a beer with me and do it on the podcast. Right, you know what yeah, I mean? Because yeah. they hear it. And they want to experience that as well. And it's like, you know, it is cool. It is a good experience. You know, I don't know. Maybe you could kind of go Joe Rogan style with it where there's just that one glass of scotch or whatever. Because yeah. I guarantee if you're drinking scotch, you're not fucking down in that shit. Yeah, I was thinking about trying to go to more of a liquor route. That way it'd be something I would. I guess it's, you know. If you get I scotch enjoy, on the rocks. I enjoy the way beer tastes. It's yeah. like people are always like, why do you drink? Uh, you know, I, I drink those monster ultras, you know, those zero everything. Uh-huh. And I just like the way it tastes. It's like, I don't drink it and going like, fuck, I'm amped now. Like, it's not an energy drink to me. It's just, it's my one thing that I drink outside of water and unsweet tea. You know what I mean? That's another thing. Drinking like, you could drink tonic water. Or I do that a lot too. Uh, me and my wife started, we started doing that fucking flavored so, uh, water shit. Just so the, you the, feel like you're drinking? Yeah, and it's not bad. Like, I, I'll buy a couple 12 packs that I keep at the shop, but I chug so much water all the time. You know what I mean? Like, I usually do a jug a day and I just, I, I go into the gas station, I get a fucking red monster and a fucking gallon of water and I kill both of them every day. You know? It's just those one days that I'm like pissed where I'm like, fuck, I want another monster. It's like, I had one usually my morning routine Mm -hmm. like that monster is like my coffee every day you know what i mean yeah and uh, i enjoy it but i i i used to be bad dude i used to be bad with red bulls dude like i never thought i was gonna get out the red bull kick especially when it came out the colors and shit they started getting flavorful and stuff that's me okay so i never used to drink coffee ever ever i want to be a coffee guy so bad dude i'm a coffee guy now okay so i used to hate coffee and i never drank it fucking ever and I, I've heard of people getting like uh, addicted to coffee, and mm-hmm. I was like, "I get addicted to this nasty shit." But I started drinking it s- instead of Red Bulls. Mm-hmm. Now, dude, I'm dead to the world unless I have a fucking coffee. So right. it's full on addictive because, like, I get to work, and I need a coffee before I go to the gym. I need a coffee before I go before I start my client for the day. Mm-hmm. I need a coffee. I don't. So it's uh, yeah. 
I mean, I that's think true. It, you'll, you'll get to where you have to have them. It's it's so weird because like you know I think that I know for I, I know myself like I think I do have an addictive personality where I get addicted to certain things like mm-hmm. yeah, like that too. monster every day or you know like I I used to be real bad with sweet tea you know what I mean and mm-hmm. then. I started like weaning myself off of it by doing like the sweet and low shit instead of sweet or instead of like straight sugar. And then I would do less of it and less of it and less of it. Now I enjoy the taste of unsweet tea. Yeah. I've been drinking unsweet tea and black coffee for yeah. years. I don't put anything. Well, I only put milk in my coffee, almond milk. Mm-hmm. I only put that in my coffee to cool it off. Yeah. Cause I can't, I don't know how motherfuckers drink hot coffee. When I used to wait tables, I'd, everyone's always like, could you warm it up for me? You know, put fresh coffee on top of it, and then they sip that shit. Yeah. Dude, every time that fucking burns the fuck out of my mouth. I don't know how the fuck they do that shit. Yeah, I see people drinking coffee, like, all the time. Like, man, it looks like it, it looks delicious, or it looks cool. It looks like a, a like, like an experience or a thing. or It is, though. You know? That, like, you see someone sitting at Starbucks with a laptop doing something important and shit. And it's it's like, an activity. Yeah, it's like, ah. Then you go in there and you get. I, I go when I go to a Starbucks with like my wife or something. I just get like a black tea or some shit. And it's. Uh, I always just get black coffee everywhere. I mean, I, I can drink black coffee. I can drink day old coffee. <laughs> I can drink cold coffee. I don't give a shit. You're full coffeeed out now. Yeah, I don't. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> so, um, didn't y'all did the art circus at uh in Orlando right recently? Yeah, we just did Orlando. Um, and Mondo came out to help on that one, didn't? Yeah, you? dude. Was Mondo the is the best fucking teaching partner I ever had. For real. Yeah. Um. Mondo, so I taught Mondo the same technique I taught you when I first met him, and he's been doing it ever since. I mean, he does his own technique too, but he's pretty good with mine. Mm-hmm. And um, I, we got to a thing where Steve wanted to do his own thing, and they wanted me to come up with a new class. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Cause I'd come up with the other one, and they thought I'd be good to come up with a new class so um and i asked him i was like well the the first class was an idea that i'd been thinking about forever mm-hmm. you'd tell me to just come up with something new and well they're like well everybody always wants to learn your monochromatic stuff and um he goes like, it's that's what everybody wants from you anyway and i was like yeah i guess i could just give them what they want mm-hmm. and so i uh was talking to mondo about it i was like I was like, man, I, I could teach my technique with um, monochromatic work, and because really, I, I, that's what I love doing. I mean, I, I like doing color, but I don't love color. Yeah. Um, and so we came up with this class, and um, Mondo, we, me, me and Mondo bring this tattoo flair to it. So um, Mondo is there to kind of help with style, mm-hmm. and I'm there for the technical reasons. So I kind of lead the class. Um, it's pretty much me. I run the whole thing and the Mondo's there to fill in the gaps. So sometimes I talk over people's heads or I, I'm too philosophical or yeah. whatever in my explanations. So Mondo's there to, um, kind of catch people where they get lost and, and simplify the answer a little bit. Um, uh, he's also there to kind of, um, make people feel more comfortable. Like, um, I've heard people say that sometimes I can be intimidating. Um, and so I'd never wanted anyone to feel that way. So Mondo's kind of there to kind of monitor that too and help people yeah. feel comfortable. Um, and then he does the um, his filigree and stuff. He's a master of the filigree and, and yeah. flow. And so he kind of shows how, how you can add style to your artwork with using the exact same technique. So that's what he does for us. And, um, yeah, so that's what it is. It's kind of, it's, it's photorealism with a tattoo flair. So it's kind of, it's kind of giving people the freedom to, um, add style Mm -hmm. to their work, um, while at the same time teaching them how to get, um, really, really detailed freehand, um, monochromatic stuff. Now we don't hold people to freehand. Like I still don't use stencils or shields or anything Mm -hmm. like that. But I give people the option to use whatever tools they think they need to use. Mm-hmm. But the technique stays the same. So 
Um, but my last class was more restrictive where I, cause I was trying to get people to stop using stencils, not because I didn't agree with them is because I didn't want people to be so reliant on this mm-hmm. crutch. Um, I wanted them to learn, uh, so this this one is a little easier on them where yeah. the focus is more about color and more about blending and more about um getting smooth gradients and things like that the stuff i talked yeah. about with you and less about um the freehand stuff even though the freehand stuff is still there would you say a lot of the uh <clears throat> the students are they more from a custom Automotive paint kind it's of thing? It's a complete it... mix of people. Yeah. The, there's some people that are there because they're serious and they want to get better. And there's other people that are there to have fun. And then there's people that are there because they're curious. Um, everyone's there for their own reasons. I really, really try to find out what everyone's doing. Like, some people are intimidated. They think my class is hard. And... My class is what you need it to be. Like, there was someone in my last class that they struggled with just with the technical stuff. And it was more, they were more of a beginner. So I tailored their lesson to them. Like, I always tell people, like, I get a lot of emails where everyone, this happens really often, where I'll get an email where people will say, I am stuck in this thing and I just want to get to that next level. Mm. I hope one day we can blah, blah, blah. So you can, so I can get to that next level. And I always say, just come to my class. Like whatever you're missing, I'll find it and I'll give it to you. Now, whether you use it or not, that's up to you. But I, I have a good eye for what, what, whatever roadblock in Mm. your, in your airbrush career that you're in, I, I'll, dissect it I'll figure it out and then I will make sure and push you through that next step so it doesn't matter if I'm painting if we're doing monochromatic class and we're painting a portrait that's that's just the class activity yeah what you need out of the class is what I'll give you that's what you know our classes are only you know sometimes 8 to maybe 15 people possibly but there's enough time because it's 4 or 5 days where I can I can give everybody individual attention. Like I can sit down with you, I can have a conversation with you and it's like, what are you struggling with? What's hard? And if what you're struggling with is more elementary, then that's what I'm gonna make you do. Mm-hmm. Like um, there's this person in particular where I just had her repainting the mouth of the character. Mm-hmm. I was like, I just want you painting these lips. And when you're done, do it again. And when you're done, do it again and when you're done do it again because i want you to understand this specific type of this this exercise yeah. which was for her it was um she just needed to be able to read the reference better and me to be able to pull the trigger better on the airbrush so i was like don't worry about the whole rest of it i just need you to be able to do this thing so i tailored her lesson to her um and then there was another guy who came in and he was just killing it yeah he showed up just balling and so i never let him sh- like whatever when he was showing you know do i wouldn't say he was showing off he wasn't showing off but it, when he was doing really well and feeling good about himself i pushed him harder yeah. i was like well okay that was easy to you well let's make it harder i was like so so he's gaining something still. oh he absolutely did i i showed him things he didn't even know he was bad at mm-hmm. or not bad at but what he did he didn't even know that he needed help in this area um, but I can see it. I can diagnose it. And so just like, you know, I'm, I'm sure we had a little bit of that when it was you and me where you're like, oh shit, I didn't even know I was skipping this step or overlooking this thing. You know what, what my hardest thing is, and I think about this cause I had to do a, a different style of airbrush the other day where I had to do a hand. I still cannot get hands down because hands are no different than anything else. So this is my, this is what I looked, okay, this is my excuse for hands, right? Okay. So let me give you my excuse. When I, when I see hands, you know, I see the shadows, I see the, I see everything there that I'm supposed to paint, like if it was a face or some lips or, you know, even like teeth, you know, in the lips or whatnot. But it's like nothing's that darkest spot that you bring out. It's all so subtle. And it's like, there's no, like you see these cracks, they're not as, 
you know, on your knuckles are not as like... Well, that's the like at the beginning of the technique when you're in your light layers. You do all that work in the light layers. It'll look rough or it'll look harsh in those first few layers. Mm -hmm. But by the time you put that one dark shadow that's under maybe one finger, it'll subtle out all that stuff on yeah. the inside. So that stuff that was probably hard to pull off because it was you were probably making it too harsh. Mm -hmm. Um, do all the harshness in your bottom layer and then when it time to do they they say I, I heard it's almost this, like not using your you know like say like I still use the the whole you um, want to do all your work in the middle yeah not in the okay black is your highlight and white is a highlight mm -hmm. okay you never want to black is 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 a finisher white is a finisher mm -hmm. you do all your work in the middle and then when you you black should be like barely even touching yeah. the somewhere that where the, where the black is you barely touch it and where the white is you barely touch it and all of a sudden that thing gets a lot of life to it so that's one of the things i, I show people too it's like hands to me i don't see hands mm -hmm. i don't see eyes i don't see face i don't see anything all i see is shape yeah and value and shadows like i don't see I see form. I don't see finger, fingernail. Uh, granted, fingernails can be hard. The reason is, is most photographs don't pick up on the fingernail very well. So when it's time for you to paint the fingernail, mm. there's not a lot of information in the reference. So you're like, how in the fuck, where is the base of the fingernail? Where is it shaped? And sometimes you just gotta paint what you see. Yeah, It's not a fingernail anymore. And like, cause there's often times where I'll get to the fingernails and I'm like, I don't know what fingernail shape this really is because it's, it's blur. Yeah. And so what I do is I just mimic the blur as best as I can. I paint the blur. Yeah. And then you'll find that, oh shit, there's the fingernail. It just happened to be in the blur. You didn't see it. But when you paint the blur, you'll look at your painting and like, oh fuck, the fingernail's already in there. Mm -hmm. Cause I just mimic that blur. That's what I do. I a good practice for that like um i freehand um hair and i freehand uh lace patterns and things like that um or like even like this wood texture yeah i could i could freehand all of this wood precise because i don't even though most people might see it as confusing to me it's just a dark shape next to a medium shape next to a light yeah. shape and i just stay in that and so you then all of a sudden you'll back up and you're like oh fuck that's wood like in the same with hands so yeah. I, it's it's a mind thing like if we were to work together right now i would show you it and you you'd be like oh okay it's 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 mental you're never painting hands you're always painting a whether it's light dark medium yeah just the values of it yeah 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 and that's that, that's probably you know like i said it's 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 that anxiety i get because i know that I've, i struggle with it mm -hmm. so when i do have a project that i have but like this, I avoid it, right? So I never get good at it. And so you, it brought to my attention when you were talking about that young lady that you were forcing to do lips over and over and over again to get used to it. And it makes sense to just, you know, just do exercises of working on that. Well, it's like the other day, um, I, I had a friend that was working on a um, portrait. He wanted to learn to, to draw portraits better. Um, and so he watched a YouTube video, drew a portrait, and he showed it to me. And he was like, not bad, huh, for my first try? And I was like, yeah, not bad, but do you want me to show you something, mm -hmm. something else? You want me to show you, where you wh what you're missing? He's like, oh, yeah, any critique you want, yeah. And I was like, so I, I, what I did is I zoomed in and I started showing him. Um, he was generalizing all the shapes. He wasn't seeing, he was seeing lips, mm -hmm. nose, eyes, mouth. He wasn't seeing the form. He, yeah. he, he's not thinking in the right... Um, if, if you're thinking lips, you're thinking wrong. You should be thinking, here's a shape that protrudes this way and then recedes that way and the texture moves this way. And so I started showing him these subtle angles and these subtle shapes that he hadn't seen before. And I started showing him how to pull out character and all of a sudden his like, he just sat there and his like eyes just opened wide. He was like... I was like, yeah, most people can't, most people don't see this, but once you see it, once yeah. I show it to you, you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. It's there now. And it's like the whole, like Corey St. Clair was the first one that showed me that where it's just like the door opened up and you see everything. And I was showing him the subtle angles of like the lips and these certain little details that, 
you don't have to make them detailed. They don't have to be hyper realistic, mm -hmm. but they do need to be there. So like when he was like, he would just throw a, a shadow under the lips because we were raised in a, we raised on cartoons mm -hmm. and cartoons show us these basic shapes. And so we think we know what lips look like. So we, no matter if you're looking at a reference or not, you're trusting your brain more so than you're trusting your eye. Yeah. And so but you can see those type of sketches that people do like that, where the, the eyes are very, you know, look like what you think an eye would look like. Just the, it's you the know. same eye shape. And I'm like, and I'll tell them, I'm like, why did you draw a curve here when it's very clearly a triangle? Yeah. If you would have actually looked at the reference and got close to it and looked at it, you would have seen that there was a triangle shape there. There's a point here, but yet you drew a curve because you look, you said, I, eyes are curved on top curve. Yeah. And so, um, that's one of those things that I work on. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just training your eyes. I always tell people it's not, it's not a talent. It's not like, some people are born with it and others aren't. Yeah. No, it's me training your eyes. Like, okay, we paint cars and you got a lot of car painters watching this or, or listening, right? So when you paint cars, when you first looked at, at a car, um, my dad used to do this all the time. He used to like, um, that fender was painted and he would like, or, or he'll say there's Bondo on that rear fender because he can see through the paint, Yeah. right? He can see dents from a mile away. He can feel dense with his palm. Now, how many times if you would have started painting, do you, you know how to feel dense with your palm, yeah. right? The first time you ever tried to feel a dent, where were you going, I don't feel shit, dude, was yeah. the guy going, dude, you don't feel that dent? And you're sitting there rubbing your hand on it going, I don't know what the fuck you're feeling, but I don't feel shit, yeah. right? But then that day that it clicks and you learn how to put your palm on the side of the car or this whatever and you feel that dent or that hump in the body mm -hmm. work or whatever, you can't unfeel it anymore. You can't mm -hmm. unsee it. And so it's the same with artwork. Once I show you those subtleties, they're there. You'll see them every time. Just like when you a car or a bike rolls down the road, yeah. you'll you'll see every you can see I guarantee you can see body work under everything you see, yet the person sitting next to you probably was like, I don't know what the fuck you're looking at. It looks like yeah, a car to yeah. me. You know? It's that's what it is. It's in your eyes. It's training your eyes to see it. Once you see it, it's there. It's there forever. So Yeah, that's a... It's weird all the all the different things that you'll notice and you, you like it's it's not I guess painters are kind of always naturally like we can for sure enjoy someone else's work, but I think it's always natural for us to look for the flaws. You yeah, well I mean? when you do something, that's why I, I say this all the time too. I'm glad I'm not a musician because now I can really appreciate music. Yeah. I don't want to be around some musician when I'm listening to music, picking it apart. Yeah, I can't well, tell you how many times you're, you're sitting next to a musician and they're like, oh, the drums here suck. And I'm just like, they sound fucking good to me. Dude, when my brother started getting into music big time, you know, like out of nowhere, we're like listening to Led Zeppelin and he's like, dude, I don't know how people like this. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Yeah, I'll yeah. kick you out of the car. Dude, so it's like, a 4-4. Four, four. It's supposed to be a 3-2. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, but I like it. Yeah, it's like, dude, like do something with yourself and then come talk shit about Led Zeppelin. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like Led Zeppelin or somebody else from like that era, like maybe some Pink Floyd or just something that was like... Something that was worth talking shit about. The, well, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was Jimi Hendrix. He was talking shit about Jimi Hendrix. Oh, I was like, geez. dude, get the fuck out of here. Well, it's, but you know what? Me being an artist, and I say this all the time, I, it's a shame. I, I pick every single thing I see apart. I was in the fucking bathroom today at the restaurant and there was a... Um, is exactly what I just got finished talking about. There was a painting of a cat that was made to look like a musician, like, um, what was the cat? It was supposed to look like uh, Amy Winehouse. Oh, shit. And this cat looked really fucking awesome, right? But then I looked at Amy, the Amy Winehouse hair, and it was all these, like, random scratches, right? Now, to the naked eye and the most people, yeah. They probably would have looked at it like, damn, that cat looks just like Amy Winehouse. I was sitting there going like, these motherfuckers can't draw hair for shit. Yeah. Right? So, and that's that's how I looked at it. Like, instead of just enjoying this cat, Amy Winehouse, I was sitting there going like, man, I, sh I should probably, if I meet this person, I could show them how to draw hair. <laughs> you know, like, Yeah. but, you know, whatever. Well, at the same time, I think there's also like, you know, Put like this, I have respect for certain flaws and I have, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, 
I, I'd see painters that are like regarded very high and you know in the paint world and I would see flaws that are just laziness yep and laziness I, I've always felt like that's something that somebody should be able to pick you apart on but skill like there's so many different levels of skill between you know a you know your artwork and my artwork is airbrush artists like there's a there's a big gap there so like i wouldn't if if the roles were reversed i wouldn't go to your paint job and be like ah your airbrush not work isn't that great yet you know what i mean but if you you know like when it, people are a certain level of competent yeah their f flaws are no longer flaws i don't think mm -hmm. it's style at that point yeah 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 so what i see a lot is i'll see people who you know like they'll have blow bys under the tape that they leave or mm -hmm. you know like i'm not a great pinstriper but i get it done you know what i mean so um i try my best to do it everything perfect and you know usually it's pretty nice but i'm not perfect at it right so i don't really f like if i see someone else that has some you know like i always see the crooked line in that one or i see a little little jolt i'm like i'm not like super anal about it or oh if that whole fucking paint job's horrible now i'm like yeah but there is something to be said about those flawless motherfuckers, yeah, right? Exactly. Dude. It's like it, it's like you were saying about those tattoos you'd see, and you're like, "Fuck, man! How how is this dude just slinging a line down the side of this car without skipping a beat and staying the same like weight? Yeah, you know, it, like pinstriping is like one of those things to me that's like it can be very like it's so simple in its nature what it is. But there's so much riding on the the user and the hand and, and their method that you get to a point where you're like, all right, I know how he's doing it, but I don't have what he has right. yet. You well, know? you you don't, or nor, maybe you don't have the energy to put that effort into yeah. it. Yeah. Like we said earlier about being that one trick pony where you're yeah. like focusing so hard on being so perfect. Like I got decent at airbrushing because I airbrushed every fucking day when I was younger, right? So that that's what got me familiar with it. The muscle memory of airbrushing was, you know, it wasn't like I picked up an airbrush for the first time in your class. I'm like, so how does this work? And I had been doing drop shadows for so long that I had muscle memory there, right? Mm -hmm. So certain things came a little bit more natural. And then as like art theory started working its way into the airbrush work, then slowly it got better, you know, and there's still so much more that can happen to get better and whatnot but it's the same thing with graphics it's like you start seeing graphics and how you can fit it on that canvas and that canvas is always three-dimensional you know so when you're drawing sketches you're drawing you know two-dimensional with a three-dimensional eyes at it like okay i right. see how this is going to go over the bag and it's going to pull down and i spent so much time you know with certain types of projects like baggers and shit i see them in my head like you know, you ever got those things that you can just draw three dimensional at any time because you've seen them so many. You can just sketch out a back end real quick from this angle because you've seen it so much that you see it in your head. Yeah, and that's kind of you know I don't know where the fuck I was going with that. <laughs> practice, man. But yeah, the practice of anything it makes it a lot more fluid and stuff. And uh, but I think that everybody is in the custom paint world it's all about fixing your flaws that we all have you know what i mean yeah when it comes to shit and some of them like i said and it's also staying in your lane staying in your lane like like yeah it used to piss me off that i wasn't better at laying tape mm -hmm. yet i didn't have the energy to get better yeah you know what i'm saying like i hated doing it and i hated that i wasn't good at it so i knew that it took me um, I knew I could be good at it if I had that level of dedication to it, but I hated doing it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So when I did it and I would struggle through it and then I'd pull off something really nice, if somebody had anything negative to say about it, I would immediately get fucking pissed. I'm like, really? bitch, you do it then. Yeah. You know, but now I'm different. Like, I don't you care. You did that, that Marilyn Monroe tank you did. Did you do all the graphics that was yeah. on that? So those graphics were... No, really I can do it. Yeah. It, but it ain't like it's it came without nature. its fucking yeah. holes in the wall that I yeah. would punch, you know? Like, I, 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 I'm, I can be good at it. Yeah. But I hate every second that I'm doing it. Do you know what I'm saying? I mm -hmm. just never... That's kind of how I am with airbrushing. <laughs> <laughs> It's like I want to do it, but I, I guess the other thing, I guess the sad part actually is what it is, is for me is I've always relied on custom paint to pay my bills. 
it, it's very rarely been something that I've done for the enjoyment of art, right? I do enjoy it as art, but when I picked it up, it was like I had a kid to feed. I needed to learn how to make money. So there was that, that fire was the reason why I pushed getting into this shit and getting good at it. Um, and then there was a phase in time where motorcycles weren't that big in my life. And so I spent a lot of time doing artwork and, and canvases and all this other crazy shit. But then I started drinking, you know, I didn't drink back in the day. I didn't start drinking till I was 30. You know what I mean? So when I was, when I was, I I picked up an airbrush at 22 or three doing drop shadows and shit under like flames and stuff. Yeah. And I didn't actually start doing like any kind of real airbrush, like pictorial type stuff for probably like three or four years. So I was probably like 26. Well, you're an example of, okay. So I hear this a lot. A lot of people, they put, um, limitations on themselves Mm -hmm. and it sounds like you're a case of a type of person that would have maybe put a limitation on yourself saying oh since i don't draw or since i you know yeah yeah i'm not that i'm not going to be good at it but you are good at it yeah and it i don't think i mean not to discredit you know downplay talent or anything but i think you're good at it because you needed to be good at it so you got good at it and that's what it's hard for a lot of people to understand that Mm -hmm. like and it's frustrating as a teacher or, or not even a teacher. Sometimes I'm just an observer of somebody else mm-hmm. to be like, dude, you can be good at this. Just like I fucking hate taping out graphics, but I can be good at it if I had to be. Yeah. And I, I the, I, like I said, you're fucking brilliant at airbrushing now. Mm-hmm. You, you do just as good or better than anyone. And so it's an example of you don't have to be like me drawing since yeah. you pick up a pencil like you well, you know the the other thing is I, i've I, like I, I was saying just while ago is like i attached a, a monetary value to everything so like everything that i do want to learn how to do it's like fuck man like I, if i add this this next skill set to my paint jobs then they're worth more money or they're this or they're that or or i can i can do this you know what i mean and it, it's always about like, and I don't know if it's sad or not, but it's like, it, it is about money for me. Like the artwork is, I want to get better at it because I want to make more money. Well, I think it's like, you know? it, well, you, you say that, but I think you're discrediting the fact that you do it to begin with. If it was about money to you, you would have a normal job. Yeah, dude. So I always think like, you know, people ask me a lot because of listening to this podcast. Like, so, you know, if you started doing something else and you make good money, like say this podcast, for some reason, I start being able to make a real living off this. I would still paint. I would. I would love to paint. So things. then, it's false that you don't. That you only do it for money. Well, I think. So, I wonder why I don't want to do it now when I have free time. You know what I mean? Well, when I have free time, I don't want to draw paint. I want to go hiking. <laughs> yeah, that's you weird. know what I'm saying. Like yeah. I, 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 I used to though. I used to like when I had. I remember getting off work. You know, I used to work at Other Side Customs, airbrushing and graphics all day long. I would get off, go home, and I would paint skateboards and canvases and all this shit because I was so hungry. Because we were kids, man. Yeah. <laughs> we're not kids. Now I'm like, fuck that, man. I'm not taking my airbrushes home. Fuck that shit. I draw now. It's practice. Yeah. Like, okay, so if I draw on my free time, it's not because I'm trying to pass the time. Yeah. That's what I did when I was in high school. I drew because I drew. Yeah. But now I draw because, okay there's something I need to work on. Like, yeah, that's, that's what I do too. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I need to work on my, this, or I need to work on my, that. So I go and I work on it. And so like, I'll sketch like just the other day it was, I know I need to be able to draw out of my head better. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the, my next goal is to be able to just do it straight out of my head. Yeah. And, um, so I, you know, faith was out of town. I was bored. I was like, okay, so I'm going to draw out of my head. That's what Mm -hmm. I was doing. And, and, you know, we have a table in the back of our trailer. I wasn't drawing for fun. Yeah. I was drawing because I knew that there was a skill I needed to be better at. So at the same time, it was fun. So, I mean, um, yeah, I I think you're you're not giving yourself enough credit for enjoying it. Well, I I guess, you know, it's just kind of like looking – for me, I guess I'm looking at it from – this point in my career in life versus then and trying to understand like you know because sometimes i do like you know, like I, said, I got a cool a lot i have a lot of really cool shit sitting in my shop that's mine 
that I would love to paint up and make it cool and either hang it on my wall or sell it or whatever. I mean, I did a skateboard last winter and sold it for a lot of fucking money before I even finished it. And I have 10 more skateboards sitting at the shop. I'm like, I could literally go pay my rent just knocking these skateboards out, but I don't have the desire to do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the reason I did that skateboard is because I was trying to practice this new style of paint work that I'm trying to evolve my stuff into. So that skateboard was like a practice trial run, right? And I did it and it was cool, put it up and it sold. But now I'm kind of, I'm I'm not saying I'm done and I'm there and I got it, but I don't have an idea that I want to practice. See, I don't either. Like it's not unique. You know, like I... Honestly, like the only reason I paint anymore, it's because I'm either teaching or trying to prove to myself that I still got it. Yeah. That's it. Like, because I tattoo, you know, so much. Do you not ever think like, man, it sucks. You know, I was talking with uh, that dude, Scott from Chemical Candy Cut. I don't know if you ever, he's a pretty known guy in the chopper paint world. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me that uh, one of the dudes from Cali hit him up and they were, I don't know if this has gone through or if it was for real, but they were working on a TV pilot for like a uh, custom paint show that's kind of like Ink Masters type shit, right? Probably. There's another one of those every day. But it's like, I wonder if like real legit, like if, when you think about just the airbrush aspect or just custom paint in general, how I feel like it could be so widely like people enjoy looking at it if they were to, to I see was it just talking, that. okay, I got a friend of mine. <laughs> see, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I might act on it. But... I got a friend of mine that uh, is active in a lot of those types of shows, yeah. and um, I got on the same topic of like if I was to do a show, it wouldn't be a competition. It wouldn't even it be, there'd be no bitching and moaning, and and I think these shows like what we do deserves the right framing. I guess mm-hmm. it doesn't need to be a shit show. Competition shows are fucking stupid. I know they. I know they. I know that they're they're good for like exposing people and they're good for like um entertaining i think some of them can be great for exposing the whole idea of what it is i mean think about when the tv show like like you i've already heard like you know how you a lot of tattoo artists feel about the tattoo shows but you can't deny that when the shit came out you know 15 years ago almost it did a lot for it did a lot yeah yeah i agree so i don't like okay so there's a, you know, I would, I always, everybody always asks me if I would do Ink Master or something like that. And I'm like, my, my first answer is no. But in the back of my mind, like, there, cause there was a time I wanted to be on TV and all that shit, mm-hmm. but that's, that time's gone. Like, I don't really care anymore. Yeah. But then I'm thinking, okay, so I'm traveling the country in an RV right now. That's my lifestyle. I need clientele. So you need the exposure. From coast to coast. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so maybe I should go try to be on Ink Master. Like, but then I'm like, do I want to do that to myself? Because I'm super competitive. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, if I go get on Ink Master, I better fucking do good. Yeah. Do I want that? Do I want that stress in my life? I think about that, and I'm like, like I was thinking about that. I think about it a lot. I was thinking about it today. I was like, all right, if I was to be on Ink Master, I guarantee I would train like an athlete. If mm-hmm. I was, to, yeah, like I would, I would work with everybody, and I would train just like an athlete to be on the show. But I don't do it anymore. Like before, I did it because I wanted to be on a show and I want to be famous or some shit like that. That's what I would have done, like in my twenties. Mm-hmm. Now I could give a fucking. I, I care less about being famous. I, in fact, I don't want to be famous, but I do. However, want clientele mm-hmm. from coast to coast. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. So it's good for that, I guess. Like if there was a paint show, maybe I would do it. I don't know. I don't know. It depends on how it's framed or how. It, I just feel like it would be, like, there's so many talented people, you know, and this kind of plays into what we talked about earlier. Where I'm, I'm over it now. Like I'm, uh, like our old conversation about semen and all that shit. But it would be nice if, other than just the like, put it like this, when the biker build off shift came back, biker build off stuff came to the TV, that really shined a light on custom paint. Right. Mm -hmm. It got super popular after that. I mean, I would I could honestly say that it made me more interested in what I did for a living, because at the time I'm sitting here sanding parts. I'm like, oh, that shit's fucking another car getting sanded. I'm like, oh, wait, you could do all this art on here, too. And it opened my eyes to the custom paint world. Well, 
now, I mean, obviously, there's tons of YouTube things. There's tons of like. Maybe social you media should come stuff. down to the art circus and you can talk to <laughs> some of those guys and be like, I mean, we have connections to like if you had a good idea for a show. I I do think that there needs to be a decent show. Well, it it's, it blew my mind that there was a body painting TV show, and I'm like, I that's for that one, such yeah. a small amount of. I'm, okay, I'm probably like I said when we talked about our social the body community. painting. The reason is because there was naked women involved. That's yeah. why it was hot. Yeah, that's it, it, plain and simple. You're gonna get ratings if there's hot chicks on there. I mean, <laughs> dude, it brings me to the only time I've ever body painted in my whole life was when I was also tattoo apprenticing back in 2008. And this dude, this shop that I worked at, they hit me up and goes, "Hey man, there's this, there's these swingers, man. They they're doing a co- they're doing a costume party." And they want to all get painted up like different superheroes. And I was like, I've never done body paint before. And I'm like, all right, cool. Fuck it, whatever. So I went and got all the shit to do it with. <laughs> it was like body painting a bunch of dudes <laughs> and real big bitches. And I was like, I'm never fucking doing this shit again. It was the most. And like, you know, big chicks with big ass saggy titties. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like putting a Superman emblem on her yeah. chest. And I was like. This is not what I imagined. I've most this to definitely be. <laughs> been there before. <laughs> I was like, "This is fucked up, man." But um, but I, yeah, they, I, 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 I do think that there needs to be a show. now again. If there's a competition show, hell yeah. I mean, if it if it gives a new revitalization to what we do for a living, mm-hmm. I'm all about it. You think how many fucking picking up cars and garages and flipping them? How many shows can like how many more of those shows can there be like? Sometimes people just need to take a gamble. Like, there's definitely drama in in all the shit that we've talked about. The anxiety of being an artist. Yeah, the there's drama, being, but you don't need it. Now, well, I understand you, that there's a there's a okay because the thing is they're selling these shows to people sitting at home eating chips. Exactly. That yeah. give they don't fucking care about paint. All they care about is this entertaining to me. Mm-hmm. Kardashians and shit. So. So they're trying to sell paint to people who don't care about paint. Well, yeah, so you got to look at it like this. It's it's 90% people that are never going to be your customers, you're interested. They're just interested in like, oh, let's, let's check this out. It's like that duck call show. Nobody cared about the <laughs> yeah. duck calls. Yeah. So there's 10% that, of people that are going to watch that and it's going to inspire them or they're going to come into your you know world of things. And those, like I said, when you're looking at these type of numbers of, of – you know, a hundred thousand people. I don't need a hundred thousand customers. I can't handle a hundred thousand customers in a lifetime. All no. I need is a good amount of them. You just need a good base. I, I would, I, like I said, you, I got a friend, I got a couple friends actually, but I got one friend in particular who was on one of those tattoo shows. And I was talking to him the other day cause he travels all the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, how do you, how do you afford to travel all the time? He's like, everything's comped. And I was like, what? And he's like, everything's paid for. And then they, I was like, because you were on one season of one show? And he's like, yep. I was like, okay. Yeah, it's like, you know, I was talking with Ryan at uh, Counts Customs. Like, dude, like most of the guys on the TV shows that do custom paint, they don't have shit for social media followings. Unless, you know, some of them do. Some of them, a lot of them don't really. You know what I mean? But then you got like all these companies that are giving them shit like Ingersoll Rand and House of Color. Everybody's, oh, we got to give the fucking TV painter all kinds of shit. And most of these guys, not talking shit, just most of them are just painters. Mm-hmm. They're not like graphic guys or artists. They're just, you know, I know how to paint a car. I know how to blend a fender kind of guys. You know what I mean? And so you're like, well, fuck, man. Like, how do I get some of that fucking, uh, you know, sponsorship love or whatever? You know what I'm saying? So it's like... Uh, you kind of got to be on TV. You know what I mean? You got to do that shit. It's It's just, it's the nature of the beast. It's just like we were talking about in the beginning of the people who are doctoring up their tattoos on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a part of me that hates them because they're creating this unrealistic standard. Mm -hmm. But there's another part of me that's saying, well, fuck, they're making them a lot of money. And so I can't hate on them for fucking making a lot of money. I mean, they're doing their thing. It might... Like, you know, there's, there's, there's a couple people I can think of in particular where I'm just like, I want if like, if my younger me would have gone like, motherfucker, you better quit pay, posting this fucking fake ass shit. Now the older me is like, Hey man, dude's got to make money. Yeah. You know, like if that's what, and, and he's working, 
You yeah. know, so it's like I hate it, but I don't hate it. Like, yeah, see, I, I'm not, I'm not mad at anybody that's doing well. Like as far as like the guys that are just that, I'm just like fuck, man. Like how, like how, like I don't. I guess it goes back to what we've all talked about before. Is like I don't want to be a kiss ass. Like I want to be respected for the work I do, and I want the opportunities to come from the type of work I do, not because I'm like, you know, knocking at everybody's door. Like you know, I, I've thought about. I, I know a lot of people that work at Gas Monkey Garage. Mm-hmm. I've worked with them in shops in my life. But I've never, ever walked in there and said, hey, y'all ever need any airbrush work? It's like, I don't really want to do it. But every once in a while when I'm super stressed out of work, I'm like, I wonder if I can get a job there. You know what Yeah, I mean? just to create that. But, but, but I also, I have no desire to be on TV, man. Like I, I I'm the same way. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. There's a show idea that I have. If it came where... I had the opportunity to make a show. I would do this specific show, mm-hmm. but I'm not going out of my way mm-hmm. to try to push something. It is, it, it, it's a show I would want to do for the same reason that I do the art circus. And for the same reason that I do the, do, that I want to do your podcast and all that is because I want to better the, in, I want the industry to stay alive. I want to support the industry. Yeah. And I, if I do a show, I want the show to support the industry. And that's why I'd want to do it. Not because I want my fucking face in front of the camera. Yeah. Like, and honestly, when I was on YouTube all the time and I started getting quote unquote famous, I guess, whatever through there, the more popular I became, the more uncomfortable I was with it. Yeah. Like, although I do like, like, I, I do like... When it's good, it's good. When it's bad, it's bad. Yeah. You know? I, I, I don't mind hamming it up for the camera and talking to the camera and being happy and not... And, and, like, I could do it. Like, if I was a host of some show and, and you know, featuring you or something like that, I could do that. But yeah. um, at the same time, it's I wouldn't want to do it because I want... In fact, I had a client the other day, a client friend... But I was tattooing him, but he's mm-hmm. a friend. He's on a show, he's on a few different shows regularly, all the time. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want any part of fame. Um, I think Ryan Evans might be a little bit like that too. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but um, he does it because he likes to do it and it helps support his business and helps support the industry. But he definitely does not do it because he wants. Yeah. He's a, you know, he, he'd rather be by himself. You know, like, uh, I've been really wanting to do a lot of different YouTube things, you know, with ourselves. And um, I, I just don't have the time. I, I, I'm still learning, but I don't have as much time to, like, just, like, go hard for a month learning how to do video editing. editing. So, uh, you know, I think we're, I'm going to start doing, like, some, like, like, live videos on, like, YouTube and shit. Once you do a live video, you can just save it and it'll be in there, right? Like, still. Yeah. So I think I might just do some of that for a while and like show some. That's how I am too. I don't want to do YouTube anymore because I don't want to edit anymore. I don't have time for it. Yeah. Not, and and I'll say that, like, once you're so popular on YouTube, it becomes not what it was. Yeah. Like if you like, when I used to do my YouTube to teach people, it all of a sudden started becoming like it didn't become, but it would have become. Now I'm a YouTube personality or some shit like that where. It kind of stops being what it was. But if you're just streaming yourself, yeah, that's better. Or, like, I, I've, I've, I've had this hang-up. I haven't been able to get in front of the camera in years. Like, I don't know why. I just... I just I, I just don't want to do... I don't know. It's I feel weird. I used to have no problem being in yeah. front of the camera. Like, zero problem. And now I just... I just don't... I don't, I don't know. I... I, uh... <laughs> It's funny, I have no problem talking on this. I have no problem talking at a table with 15 dudes that I know real well. Uh, my buddy asked me to go talk at his, he teaches like a community college here for like auto body and shit. Uh-huh. And he wanted me to come talk in one of his classes. It's a classroom setting about using social media to you know boost your business up and stuff like that, right? And I was like, man, usually I can sit around a table and talk about this all night. And I'm like standing up there and I'm just, I'm short. I'm I'm like making eye contact with like, you know, different people. It's just weird. Like one good thing about when I used to do YouTube is I would ramble. Mm -hmm. Like I'm pretty good at just talking to myself. Mm -hmm. Faith knows this. (laughs) Because anyway, I, 
but that's what I would do. I'd go off on my regular tangents mm -hmm. that I usually go off on anyway about a certain topic, and then I would watch it, and then I'd cut it up. Yeah. That's that's how, like, when, if you're talking about, like... Well, that's, that's, that's exactly it. That you just kind of, like, brought me back to why I do this is because when I first started doing this podcast, when I would go back and listen to them before I release it, I'd have... I would sometimes not release them. I'm like, ah, oh, man, I fucking a bunch of boring shit in there. Well, bullshit. I just I found I sound like a dumbass, or I'm <laughs> this, or I'm start I'm I'm so conscious of myself, and so that's kind of the same thing with like videoing. If I'm videoing my fucking self, which is weird, it's like a constant selfie. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you go back and you watch it on you. Like I just don't, I don't have it in me to to. I don't know. Be different if someone else was filming me and then they did all that. Then they did it, right? Yeah. You don't have to look at yourself. You don't have to edit yourself. Yeah. I've said that a hundred times. I'm like, when back in the day, I was fine editing myself and talking to myself and all that shit. Now, like, if somebody else wanted to do it, yeah, I'll do it. Just I don't want to see myself on camera. I don't want to talk to myself. I don't want to chop up my words anymore. Yeah. I guess it's because maybe because back in the day, I didn't have any, I didn't know anyone. Like when I was in front of the camera, there was nobody to tell me that anything that I said was. Also, I think that I think with, there's so much different types of content out there now. So some of the things that inspired me to want to do YouTube shit aren't even motorcycle or paint related. It might be something else. So now I'm holding myself up to that standard of this dude that does this for a living. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't want to put out anything that doesn't even look comparable to that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it might be an unrealistic, uh, like thing to, so you're like me, you're just self-conscious, but you know what? If we weren't that way, we wouldn't be good at what yeah. we do. Like, well, it's like, I don't want to put anything out. Even if it's a fucking t-shirt about my brand or my, right. what I am, if it ain't fucking good, good, I don't want it out there. So people are like, oh man, you know, and I'm not really good at designing t-shirts, you know, but there's a couple people in our industry that do really great jobs at it, but so does every fucking buddy uses them. So it's like, I don't want that now. You know, it's like, yeah. I don't want to be the guy that gets the same guy that everybody else in the industry uses. You know what I mean? Like it, like I, I respect it, but it's kind of, it's artwork. Now every t-shirt looks like that guy's artwork. You know what I mean? Yeah. In some weird way. And I know that that's the same thing if it was some other guys. Well, artwork. I'm the same way too. Yeah. I, that's why I don't have a t-shirt. I don't yeah. have a, I don't even have a logo. I don't like. I got a bunch of logos, but. I don't have any of that shit. Like, I know that that's my goal for this year is, like I said, Faith and me, are, we're trying to get this lifestyle off the, where we travel. You need to brand it. Yeah. It needs to be branded. You need to have your big. Your you need on the side of your your RV needs to have your Instagram and your shit, yeah. dude. Like, I see people with cars that do that shit, and I'm like fucking nerds. I'm like I look at like fifty thousand fucking followers. Yeah. He's got a stock ass SRT charger or some shit. I'm like, yeah, that's how fuck? you got to do it though. Like yeah. we haven't branded our shit, but that's my goal for the year. Because like I said, we're trying to go coast to coast every year. Yeah, we want to go with satellite uh, trips in between, but yeah. we're trying to go from. Florida to Dallas to California back to Dallas back to Florida and, and, and keep that up while still heading up the East Coast or heading yeah. up and the only way we're going to do it efficiently is if I brand myself and and do that and that's my goal I got to do it that way because right now Dallas we're doing great like if I just lived in Dallas just normal I could Be live fine. out the rest of my yeah. days all good and dandy but um, but that's not my goal my goal is to travel permanently yeah so so anyone watching this or listening to this, you got any listeners in Florida or California? Uh, lots in California, a lot. California is like our second biggest listen to market in yeah. the LA and the Bay Area. Well, look me up in California then. Yeah. And then in Florida, we have quite a few around the uh, Tampa, Orlando area. That's where we go, Tampa. Yeah. So uh, when we're in California, um, I spend a whole lot of time in Lake Forest. Mm -hmm. That's where we do like uh, Laguna Beach area um, and that's in the winter so we spend we're, gonna, we're probably going to spend most winters as far as right now is concerned um, in that area mm -hmm. and then we're going to spend um, this time of year I guess here in Dallas and then by spring we want to which right now right about now we're going to Florida in two weeks mm -hmm. um we want to be in Florida by spring, so like the tornado season, we would rather be in Florida. Mm. And then, oh, damn. 
Yeah, I don't know what's going on over there. Oh, it's a package just next door. But anyway, um, so, and then we're going to do satellite visits. Like, we're trying to go up the East Coast and stuff like that. So, we're, I'm not really so concerned about having a clientele in, like, New York or anything like that. Mm. But um, definitely trying to build a good client base in Tampa area. So, anyone in Tampa, look us up. We're going to be there, like I said, um, in two weeks. We'll be there for the month of May. And then back here. So, traveling in the RV. But the May is uh, the art circus here. You're doing this? We're going to do the art circus, drive straight from the art circus to oh, okay. So, to just jump on 10 right there. And yeah, we're going to stop in Louisiana, um, New Orleans. And then, um, then we're going to go, we're going to stop in Destin, um, hang out with some friends there. Then we're going to go all the way to Tampa, which we actually go to Tarpon Springs, but Tampa. Yeah. Um, and then maybe go to Miami, but probably not this time. Try to go to Miami anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. And then uh, back here to Texas, and then we're going to make some money, save our pennies, go back to California. So are you still making decent okay on California, or is it just still like a lot of learning? I think we were talking California, about that before. I would like to make better money in California, um, have better clientele. That's, that's a huge goal of mine. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to spend... Have you thought about, I mean, I'm sure you have, but like, there's some pretty decent sized cities like Phoenix, you know what I mean? Like leaving LA to head back this way and being able to stop. Well, I do find out I do way better. That's why these are my satellite ones. I do way better in like your second cities. Mm -hmm. Like, like first, like, like LA, New York, Dallas, Chicago, those types of cities, I do less. Mm -hmm. but the second cities like Indianapolis type cities or Oklahoma City mm -hmm. or um, you know Kansas City I do you do better there because there's not um, as much you're bringing something new to them oh that's right yeah you know yeah. what I'm saying like California it's harder because I've, they've got all the best tattooers on the planet there yeah um, but when I go to Florida for instance you know, I can bring something that they maybe don't have as much of there. Mm -hmm. So, um, I did really good in Detroit. Um, so I'll definitely be going back to Detroit as often you as I can. Got a lot of listeners in Detroit. Dude, I ran into Ryan in Detroit. At the, he was at the same fucking hotel. For real? <laughs> yeah, he was at the bar getting drunk. Ryan Evans. Yeah, yeah. I was like, dude, I was there for a tattoo convention. He was there for um, some car thing that was going on. Mm, yeah. And, um, yeah, I thought that was crazy. Cause you know he's from Texas originally, right? Yeah, that's what he was talking yeah, about. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah, but um, I'm gonna get him on here one day. We've we've hung out a couple times, but dude, it was weird. Like I was telling you earlier, I went to the Counts Customs. While I was in Vegas to mm -hmm. go get some stuff I needed from him, and like, dude, as soon as he walks out of like their little compound into like the area where all the tourists are, really, dude, it's like a line forms. Like really, dude. Damn, I always, I always feel bad for him because, um, like I said, I know him through the through the airbrush world, so I I don't he's I don't know him as a yeah, celebrity. I just yeah. know him as a dude. And um, when Seema's around, I feel so fucking bad for him because you can see the lack of sleep in his eyes. You can see that he's like, there's a line of people. Yeah, and I'm just like, and I'm walking by, and like one year I walked past him, probably four times over the course of the week. And every time I would like want to just say hi, you know, hi to my buddy, you know, mm -hmm. and I'd be like, Ryan, and he'd look at me and he just looks at me and he shakes his head and he's just like, I can't fucking get away, dude. And I'm just like, no, 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 you do your thing. You, you be famous. I, I'll, I'll catch you next time. But it, I felt so bad. It looked like it was so much work. <laughs> yeah. We were sitting in a hotel uh, bar and um, we were talking, we were going, you know, we we're talking about pain. I learned a lot of stuff hanging out with him. I was, I was really cool talking to him about just paying applications and shit and the this bartender dude dude you know like he's like you that guy from the tv yeah and i was like dude that's a level of fame that like, you know what i mean because you get used to like you know like me with with our social media i get you know oh man i follow you on instagram but it's like at events that i did obviously somebody right right, right. Be to at. have fans outside of yeah them. so it's like it, it i mean Every once in a while, you're in the airport, and they're like, "Oh, dude, you're Jace. I follow you on Instagram. That, like, that's cool, right? Oh, that is really cool. But that, like, I, I also was wearing one of my shirts, so it was like a little bit easier to put the logo to the face to the Instagram, which is why we need shirts. Yeah, 
But then, like, sitting at this bar, he's, like, in a fucking, you know, some Dickies and a regular T-shirt. He just... And, and, I mean, I wouldn't say that he has, like, a distinctive... He's not, like, fucking... What's the other dude? The horny mic guy. That, that oh, yeah. Well, there. he wears fucking horns everywhere. Exactly. That's actually how I found Ryan at the bar the other night. Because I saw those <laughs> horns. And I was like, I was like, what the fuck's horny mic doing here? And I walk yeah. over, and then Ryan turns around, and he was right there with him. But it's, it's crazy, man. Like, uh... You know, like that's a different level of fame, man. Like, you know, we I've always talked mad shit about TV stuff, but dude, that, you know. <laughs> Ryan put that into perspective for me also because I had a long conversation with him about the same thing because mm-hmm. I had my hangups about like I've, I've done some things with TV before where it, the producers really show themselves how fake they are and how yeah. shitty they are. And then you watch friends of yours on shows like I've seen a few of my friends on shows where it just made them look like idiots Mm -hmm. and I was talking to Ryan about that one year and he put into perspective the good side of it like yeah and I was like man okay all right all right I I, I can get with it you know like so I have so now when I see Cal's Customs like I'm like oh cool that's a cool show or Counting Cars yeah, yeah Counting Cars it was on the other day while I was at the gym too I was watching him I was working out my, I was like oh yeah I know this guy but uh, uh <laughs> hey I know that guy <laughs> yeah that one right there right and that one that one I do that a lot I used to do that with the uh, Rhino too oh yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> fucking uh, what was the country Music te- television. He did the the eighteen wheelers and shit. What was yeah, it? Um, trick my truck. Trick my truck. Yeah. Well, I'd always see him on um, uh, the uh, what's that other one called? The one and one with that other dude named Ryan in it. Um, West Coast Customs. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then he was on that other Car Warriors or whatever. I had a, I had a close friend that was on Car Warriors, and he was, you know, because they'd bring different crews in to do those things. And yeah, shit. yeah. And uh, yeah. That was it. <laughs> no one recognizes him, though. <laughs> the, the, well, those are the ones you see most often. I see, I see Rhino and and Ryan. They're all Ryans, man. Yeah, it's yeah. like y'all got the right name for TV. Yeah. Well, now I can't be Ryan. <laughs> they were like, "Oh, we don't need another Ryan painter." Yeah, we're all we're out. We're, we're fresh out, out of Ryan's. Yeah. <laughs> but, Shit, man. So, I guess uh, we can wrap it up. Yeah. Where are we at? How much time are we do? Two and a half. Two and a half hours? It's late. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm glad everybody stuck around. Go to my class if you're listening yeah, to yeah. this at the Airbrush Art Airbrush Art Circus. We're doing it in um, San Antonio. San Antonio in like two or three weeks. There's still time to sign up. And like I said, don't be intimidated to take my class. Mm-hmm. Like I'm it might look hard, but even if it is, I will help you with whatever it is that you're struggling with. Mm-hmm. Um, and even if, like, if you, if it's tape out graphics, there's tape out graphic classes. There's a there's a class on building guitars. There's a class on um, doing body work. There's a class on uh, the, my old freedom freehand class is still going on. Um, then there's uh, a skulls class. There's something for everyone. But like I said, uh, if you sign up for my class, don't. Bring me your issues and let me help you solve them. I will. I know there's a lot of people. If I could only get better, yeah. I've been this good for this long. I want to break through to the next level. It don't matter if you don't even care about monochromatic artwork. Just show up. I'll help you through it. I'll dissect whatever it is you're struggling with, and I'll help you get past it. As long as it's airbrush related. Don't ask me about tape out graphics. There you go. Yeah. Well, shit, man. What's the uh let them know the Instagram and stuff again. Hopefully, though. Yeah. Uh, well, my Instagram is Ryan Townsend Tattoo. Um, I, if you want to book me for um, tattoos, um, it's better to go through my website, which is also RyanTownsendTattoo.com. Um, that's how you book me for tattoos. And then, uh, yeah, catch us on the road. Uh, I'll post on my website everywhere that we visit and our dates and everything. Um, and... Yeah, like I said, especially if you're in Florida or California area. Like, yeah. let's do something cool. Give me some portraits, please. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming out. All right, man. That was awesome, right? I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, a little bit of a paint podcast. Not really, right? It's more of a tattoo podcast, but it's just two artists talking shit back and forth, right? 
makes it always a good time. I want to thank Ryan for coming out, and you guys don't forget to check him out and uh, give him a follow as well as, uh, you know, maybe you know see about getting a tattoo. He's very talented, man. I, I, you know, I can't, I can't explain how dope this dude is at what he does. So check him out. Uh, I just want to thank our sponsors, man. I want to thank uh, Mark from Texas Performance MC, always keeping me on the road and keeping my bike dialed in. I want to thank John Jessup over there, Dream Rides, keeping. Uh, keeping this podcast going he's been a patreon supporter since fucking damn near day one so thank you john and thank you for coming up and doing this uh sponsorship with us you can uh like i said earlier you can check him out at tr- teamdreamrides.com uh check out what he has for sale and uh use that fast life one word at the end to get 10 percent off of uh, your purchases uh i also want to thank big bear performance kevin over there doing big things uh, i forgot to put his phone number out earlier but if you want to give him a call 909-478-7788 give kevin a call let him let him tell you why olin suspension is the way to go uh he can do it best if you if you haven't heard the podcast we did with him go check it out it's really uh informative uh we're gonna get him back on later and go deep into other shit too i hope <laughs> anyway also want to thank paint up for metal flake you guys rock thank you for keeping us going paint up for metal flake on instagram paint and uh thank you guys for continuing to support this podcast man through uh sharing it listening to it um if you could go rate it on whatever platform you listen to at itunes whatever just give it a rate or comment or whatever the fuck you know what i mean um also if you could you know check out our patreon man like i said it's not much a dollar is all it takes man it helps uh keep things rolling and keep us uh you know able to do some stuff and um I appreciate you doing that. You can go to our website. Sorry. Uh, fastlifegarage.com. And on the front page, you're going to see a link to the Patreon. All you do is click that link and become a Patreon. It automatically charges you a dollar a month or whatever you decide to donate. So it's just a one-time thing that you got to do. And it's uh, pretty easy going after that. So um, like I said, the more that we grow that, the more that we're going to be able to do bigger and better things. And and I want to thank you guys because it's grown enough, man. It's, or not enough, but it's grown very well. I guess I, uh, the complaining I did a couple a month or two ago really helped out. But you know, I really want to bring you guys great content, man. And uh, realistically, you know, the the financial side of it is what allows me to spend more time doing this. And um, and I really uh, like doing it, and I appreciate it, man. So uh, you know, we're gonna keep doing it regardless. I think. <laughs> No, for sure. We're going to keep doing this. And like I said, I hope to see you guys out at the camp out. If not, man, uh, there's going to be another great one up in Michigan that you're going to be able to check out as well with Steve Chamberlain that I plan on making that as well. So uh, at any rate, uh, we're going to be back real quick with another podcast this week. So uh, you guys have a good week and, uh, you know, party on. <laughs>